Okay, so we are we are on. We're gonna get started here in just a little bit. Hey, everybody, welcome. This is uh, this is Ryan Dice, and um, just want to do kind of a, a quick sound check before we get started. If you would please, uh, down in the comment box, it should be in the uh, lower right hand corner. Um, if you can hear me and you could see my screen, please just say yes, I can hear you or I can see you. Uh, fun stuff like that. Um, go ahead and do that. Okay. All right. Looks like we are good to go for the most part. So um, we're going to get started here in just a second with, uh, with this online seminar, 13 sneaky little email tricks. Uh, you're really wise to be here. Obviously, this is a very, very timely subject. But apart from it being timely with some changes that, that uh, Gmail's made, it's also just one of the single most important subjects in all of digital marketing. Uh, and, and so that's why I'm excited to be doing this, this training, and, and I'm really, really happy that you're here. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to get started. Again, the topic is 13 sneaky little email tricks, and you're going to find out that some of them are maybe a little more sneakier than, than others. My name is Ryan Dice. I am the founder and managing director of digitalmarketer.com. I'll talk a little bit about us and what we do. Uh, I'm joined on the training today by Richard Lindner who is our chief strategy officer. He's also kind of our go-to guy when it comes to all things email. So he's a really great person to have his knowledge on this subject, both strategically uh, from just a marketing perspective and also understanding the technology behind it is unmatched. I haven't seen anybody like it. It's why um, we always have Rich out speaking at all our different events that we do on this particular subject because he's just you know, one of the one of the smartest in in the business. So, I'm excited to get going. Excited to get uh, to get started. Want to kind of start off just by saying a little bit about Digital Marketer and who we are. Uh, in the last 36 months, we've actually invested over 15 million dollars of our own money on marketing tests. We've generated tens of millions of unique visitors. We've sent well over a billion emails, which is um, is especially important for this particular subject. And we've run approximately 3,000 different split and multivariate tests. And we've done all of these in our own businesses. If we were to add in the different businesses that we consult with and advise, these numbers would be a lot larger. But we have a number of portfolio companies, everything from survival and preparedness blogs to um, bed bug uh, killer e-commerce sites and, and, and things like that, even uh, have an have a industrial water filter manufacturing company. So we get to see a lot of different things and, and, and across a vast array of markets. And so a lot of people ask me, you know, what makes Digital Marketer different? There's obviously a lot of folks out there talking about marketing, education, information. Um, but uh, some, you know, people want to know what really makes Digital Marketer different. My answer is always the same. We actually do this stuff. And I think that's important. There's a lot of folks who go out there and they teach marketing and they, they talk about best practices and, and that's good. It's valuable. Uh, a lot of them are very good uh, journalists and researchers. But we take a different approach to this because we're, we're business owners. We're marketers in our own businesses. So we're just like you. I mean, our, our team that, that's, that's here in, in our marketing lab in Austin, Texas, you know, we have social media managers and community managers and traffic managers and things like that just, who might be just like you. And so we're not only out there teaching it, we're out there doing it. And so when we tell you that something works, uh, or when we tell you to try something, which we're going to be doing a lot of uh, over the course of this training, um, just know we're telling you this because we tested it, we tried it, and it's worked across a number of different businesses and a number of different markets and a number of different verticals. It's not just you know theory. It, it really is based on testing and in the trenches experience. And I do think that's important and I do think that it's definitely different. So um, with that, let's go ahead and dive into and talk about 13 sneaky little email tricks that will, uh, how to triple your open rates, double your click-throughs and sell up to 200% more with email. Before we really dive in, Rich, wanna make sure uh, you're you're on and, and uh, we can hear you. Sorry, I didn't uh, ask you that sooner, but you know, you're know you there. Can, can you guys hear Rich? Uh, I'm here Th and, and uh... Thank you for that that stellar uh, intro. I think that's maybe one of the best ones I've I've had, you know, in the five or six years in the company. So. Yeah, as, as a general rule, we don't give the best introductions. We're a little bit snarky when it comes to stuff like that. But I, yeah, I felt like that was that was very mature of me. It was. Um, yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and dive in. Um, it, one of the things that that I wanted to ask you guys is, are you freaking out about this yet? This whole um, tab system that Gmail is rolling out where they've got the primary tab, a social tab, and then this pesky promotions tab that for the most part, if you are sending out a broadcast to more than a handful of people, um, you are winding up in that promotions tab, even if 
even if I'm, we were, you know, we were talking uh, to to Neil Patel the other day, who who is uh, the founder of uh, Crazy Egg and, and Kiss Metrics, and also has a really great digital marketing blog over at, at Quicksprout.com, and he was kind of lamenting the fact that his blog updates, just updates saying, hey, I, I did a new blog post, they're winding up in the promotions tab. Uh, this is a big deal. You know, this is a, this is an issue. And, and so if you're not freaking out yet, I would argue that, that maybe you should be. Um, <laughs> but we are, you're definitely going to want to stay tuned. Uh, Rich has been doing a lot of research in this particular area. And when we get to sneaky trick number seven, we're going to talk about some different ways that you can move your, get your emails moved from the promotions tab to the primary tab. So you're going to want to stay tuned for that. We got it coming uh, to you at sneaky trick number seven. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in though first. And we're kind of going to start, the idea with these tricks is, is to roll through them in a, in a sequential manner. So kind of top to bottom when we deal with email marketing, everything begins with subject lines. So sneaky trick number one is to leverage different proven subject line types and formats. Because the fact is, nothing happens until the email gets open. You can be the best email copywriter in the world. You can have the most amazing email deliverability. You know, you can even have all of your emails go straight to their priority inbox. Bypass everything. And, and you know, it, it goes straight in there. But if your subject line is boring and nobody opens it, it doesn't matter. So that's why the subject line still, even today, with all the changes happening, not just with Gmail, but you got to know if Gmail is doing the, the tabs. Yahoo's going to be following suit. Um, you know, Hotmail, which is now Outlook, is going to be following suit. It, it's going to happen. It's going to get rolled out. Uh, but still, the subject line is, is preeminent. So here's some proven subject line formats and structures that you're definitely going to want to write down and pay attention to. Still, today, we see that having odd numbers in subject lines. So you see there, there's a dollar amount. It's not just a half a million dollars or 500000 It's $524,838.71. These weird, odd numbers definitely do tend to get higher open rates. Same with question marks. Subject lines that ask a question tend to get higher open rates, we believe, because they tend to be more engaging, right? If you're going to ask a question, the person's going to answer in their mind, and there's a little bit of mental engagement there. Percentages, um, that's good, too. Again, it, get, it goes to specificity, and it just looks weird. Um, it, it's not just words. Putting different bracketed descriptors, like new video, video, video blog post, um, free report, PDF, things like that. Those can be very, very helpful in improving open rates. You don't want to overdo it, and obviously you don't want to, you know, if you do it in every single email you send out, its effectiveness is going to decline pretty much instantly. Uh, so you want to use it sparingly, as with all these things, but but it, it works very, very well. Uh, having the RE, having the reply in, in your emails, in your email subject line, again, that does show it does we do see time and time again that you get a nice bump in open rates by having a subject line with the re as in a reply in front of it now don't use this if there is no reply or you're not reiterating anything so, um, i see a lot of people do this there's one marketer in particular that i'm on his list and i find it insanely obnoxious because at least half of the emails he puts an re in front of it and it's has it wasn't a reply at all a, a more ethical way to do this, if you want to use this RE in a subject line, if you have an, an email that you send out that does particularly well, right? Let, let's say it performs well, it gets high open rates, high clicks, good conversions. Uh, oftentimes, it makes sense to just resend out that same email again. Uh, and, and what you can do is you can resend the same email again, same subject line, put the RE in front of it, and then just at the top, have your email down below with all the header information, but at the top say, hey, I just wanted to, to reply and send this to you again because it was just too important to miss. Thanks. And that way they can just scroll down and see it. Yeah, be careful when you're doing this and make sure that you're testing because one of the things, and we're kind of talking about Google here and some of the changes that, that they've made with Gmail, be very careful if you're, if you're not changing your email up enough what Google is going to do is Google is going to actually start uh, start a chain. They're going to kind of attach that as the second email uh, from your original email that you sent, right? So it's going to it's going to look like um, if you someone's mean like just, the conversation yeah, threading. It's, it's going to just gotcha. thread the email. So you really want to make sure that you're testing that to yourself first. Obviously, hopefully, anyone who's on this this training is uh, is sending test mails before they're blasting to their list, no matter what the list size. But um, you can really hurt your effectiveness of this strategy, which, which Ryan's right, this, you know, we've, we've used this for years and it definitely gives us a bump on, on already 
really high performing emails. But now with these, with, with the different threading methods, and especially now with the threading going on the on the apps, uh, if you're using the Gmail app on your phone and where they're moving to that, it's it totally buries the email. So it has the opposite effect. So if you're going to do that, you have to change a certain amount of the actual email and you you kind of have to play around with it through some tests to make sure that it doesn't uh, gang up or thread up. Yeah, good, good, good tip. And, and you're hear, hearing us refer to Gmail a lot. Um, that's just because Gmail is the number one uh, web-based email email solution. But when we say these things, it, it for the most part applies to Yahoo and 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 uh, Microsoft Outlook and and the and AOL, the other big. They're all kind of doing the same basic stuff. So I don't want you to hear Gmail and think, oh, this only applies to Gmail. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, personal pronouns, putting you and your in a subject line. Again, you can't over you can overuse it, but people want to that you know they like seeing you. Um, and then scarcity. Scarcity works better than just about anything else. I, you know, I believe you need to use it ethically and honestly. If, if, if you're going to deploy scarcity, it should be real scarcity. So if you're going to send an email that says third and final notice, it really should be their third notice and it should be their final notice. Um, hopefully that goes without saying, but there's no doubt. I mean, if you don't care, if you, if you don't want to be constrained by the truth, which a lot of marketers unfortunately aren't and give, give the rest of us a bad name, you can send out a, a, an email tomorrow that just says third and final notice, even if there was not a first or a second notice, and it will get high open rates. It just flat out will. Uh, so, so keep that in mind. Credit card companies have proven that for, for decades. Um, okay, some other proven subject line types. Subject lines that pique curiosity, confuse, or shock can be really, really, really good. One of my favorites of all time, we sent out a, a, uh, a, an email that had some images in it, some pictures in it, and the subject line was, photos enclosed, do not bend. You know, and it, and it was just kind of being a little bit silly, and, and it was referring back to um, old direct mail pieces if they had photos enclosed, they might have that on the outside of the envelope. Um, but that got an extremely high open rate because it was just kind of weird. You know, photo enclosed, do not bend. How do you bend an email? Doesn't even make sense. One of my favorite subject lines of all time was, really? Dot, dot, dot. Really? I mean, what does that mean? Now, a lot of, you know, a, a lot of, of email marketing experts will tell you, you know, well, this really isn't best practice. And really, your subject line needs to, to perfectly describe exactly what's in the copy of the, of the email and blah, 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 blah. Look, here's the deal, guys. I don't believe that your subject line should be deceptive in any way. But I do believe that you should be have fun. I believe that you should be personal. When you email your buddies, when you email your friends, you don't write subject lines that are just perfectly descriptive. Um, so if it's not best practice in personal one-to-one -one email communication, I don't believe that it's necessarily best practice if you're doing you know broader-based emails. So I, for me, again, feel free to use your own judgment. I, I think keeping it fun and mixing it up is good. Um, another subject line that performed very, these are actual subject lines that when we went back and looked that performed really, really, really well from an open rate perspective. Uh, kind of weird, but very profitable. Um, you, you know, that's a good subject line structure. Kind of weird, but very blank. Keep that in mind. This one, chucklehead, um, sorry, this was a typo. It should be just chucklehead makes his own gun. Uh, the word chucklehead, you know, it's just kind of a curious word. Um, and, and what, you know, a chucklehead making their own gun, that doesn't sound like a great thing. Uh, negative subject lines. These are used a lot and they're very, very, very effective. I do believe that you need to make sure that you're remaining congruent with them. So if you're going to have a very negative subject line, like if you're going to say bad news or, you know, don't take it personally, but you need to maintain that, uh, that, that, that voice throughout the email. You don't want to say subject line bad news. That's going to get a high open rate, right? Um, my buddy Frank Kern calls it the rubbernecker effect. It's the same reason that that people slow down at car accidents on the freeway, right? People are drawn, sadly, to bad news. And, and so if you write a subject line with bad news or the word hate or things are bad maybe or don't take it personally but, um, these are all things that are going to get a high open rate. But if you say bad news and then the the title, you know, the, the opening line of the email is, just kidding with you, everything's fine, then you have completely broken um, the frame and, and, and you've lost them. You, you, you know, you've tricked them, you've fooled them. And nobody likes to feel tricked or fooled. So keep that in mind. Some other things you could do, borrowed credibility. Um, when we were talking about doing a training on Facebook traffic, we talked about Zuckerberg's three big secrets. Can you see Zuckerberg in there? 
borrowing credibility. Uh, Amazon wants you as a partner. Uh, Steve Jobs was wrong. We actually ran the subject line when, when Steve Jobs was, was still alive. Um, but, you know, so it, it made more sense then than it did, uh, th than it would today, obviously. You don't want to, when I say borrowing credibility, I mean using, using names and brands in your subject lines, but it has to be relevant, okay? It has to be relevant. And you can't say, you know, Oprah endorses this. You can't do that if she didn't endorse it, right? So you can't lie. Um, but if you're if, if you're using it as a as a topic, then 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 it's perfectly fine. You do want to make sure that you don't harm the frame. So if I send out uh, a, a you know a subject line that Ryan Dice is a womanizer, you know that would be very shocking. You know it, it, I would be leveraging you know my name and my brand, but I would be doing it in such a way where it wasn't really helping me out. You know, obviously, I'm not a womanizer. I love my wife very much. So um, keep that in mind when you're deploying some of these strategies. A lot of times people ask, hey, where do you come up with some of these subject line ideas? Reddit.com is one of my favorite. This was an example that we did for a buddy of ours who owns a uh, concealed carry uh, association. And uh, so we went over to Reddit and typed in uh, the keyword phrase concealed weapon because what it will then do is it will pull up all the top stories that... Um, that, that Redditors have, you know, basically voted up and that have that keyword phrase in it. So it, it's like pre-tested headlines, pre-tested subject lines. And check this one out. Naked man booked on one felony count of possessing a concealed weapon. You know, naked man, mm -hmm. concealed weapon. You figure that one out. What he did was he wrote a, a blog post referencing this story, you know, kind of pokes some fun at it and then transitioned it into, into an offer. It did very, very, very well. Uh, and again, it's a, it's their pre-tested subject lines. Google suggests is another place that you can go. We um, if you go to Google suggests and type in, start to type in a, you know a keyword or your topic, it will suggest other phrases, and these are ones that people have searched for. So you know that they're uh, with with Google suggests you're entering the conversation that's already going on in people's minds because they're these are the things that you know they're looking for. We actually have uh, a. a uh, very inexpensive but really really good piece of software called FreshKey that will automate this process. If you want to check out FreshKey.com, um, you can. Pop URLs again. It's another place just to go and see. This is an aggregator of all the top stories across a number of different news sites. So you can see number one, what's hot in popular culture. Uh, it, do you want to tie in to a to a to a story that's very current and in the news? It also will give you some additional. Um, headline ideas. So, I, you know, I love this. The, the top story for Reddit when the screenshot was taken was knock, knock, dot, dot, dot. You know, knock, knock, dot, dot, dot could just as easily be a subject line. And here you've got it tested and proven. Um, you know, when I'm in a good mood while driving, you know, you could say when I'm in a good mood while, you know, marketing or something like that. So just keep in mind, it's a good place to go. So I know we spend a lot of time on subject lines because it's very, very, very important. Um, so we'll move on now to sneaky trick number two, still on subject lines, but talking about using symbols in your subject line. And Rich, I know you've done a lot of research and testing on this, so I'll kind of let you take this one. Okay, good. So when we're marketing products, especially now, the your primary goal when you're writing subject lines and when you're composing your message is to stand out in the inbox. You have to get your subscribers' attention. Now, Ryan just went over uh, several ways to do that through uh, through templated subject lines and different strategies to create subject lines, but I kind of want to want to plus that a little bit, not to say that you, you shouldn't do that, but this is a great bolt-on when done effectively uh, to what Ryan said. So again, these, these symbols, I'm sure everyone's seen them. Uh, they've been kind of all the rage for, I guess, going on about a year. And, and one of the things that you'll notice is it's not the, the, you know, the known marketers or you know, kind of the guru in whatever space that you're in uh, that's really blazing the the trail here. It's a lot of your big companies, uh, so people are are kind of getting used to these. But it's also another way to to grab some credibility and have some guilt by association in your marketing to your to your subscribers. If big companies are doing it, there's a couple of reasons. One, it obviously works, and two, uh, you know, people are responding to it, right? So I guess that's that's the same thing. So not a couple of reasons. 
Um, yeah, can I just just to clarify, Rich? So when we're talking about the subject line symbols on the example there of Tiger Direct, that four and that eight, those are symbols. Those in, are the, in the gap, you've got the arrows in the in the email of ours. We you know we just did stars around Last Chance. Um, so where you see those little icons in there, in addition to the text, that's what we mean by subject line symbols. And a lot of people have never tested this. They've never tried it. They don't even know how to do it. And we'll, we're, we're going to show you in just a second how to do it. So I just wanted to make sure they knew what we were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the Tiger Direct example is an incredible example, um, mainly because it makes sense, right? It's not a picture of a flower from Tiger Direct saying, um, you know, TVs for sale with a flower. That makes no sense whatsoever. This is going to stand out in the inbox, but it, it also is part of the headline. So 48-hour coupons. Uh, the Gap outlet, the store-wide savings, those couple of arrows. And, and one thing that you'll probably notice if you're looking at this, especially if you're an iPhone user, is those screenshots came from my, my mobile phone, my email while I was checking inside of my email client uh, on my phone. So that's going to be important. And, and I'll go into kind of mobile application of, of these symbols in a minute. But um, yeah, so some more examples. Uh, the one that we sent, Last Chance, with the, with the black stars, that's actually the most used symbol in email. Uh, you can go down and look at, at some travel sites, goodbye, rain, hello, sun. You know, that one, it, it's cute. It may be a little, little too cute, if, uh, especially that's blurry. That was just as blurry in my inbox. You know, we love sandals. Uh, shop the hottest prints from our campaign video with a little play button. That's probably a great symbol to have. Uh, I would argue placement may be wrong at the very end of the email, depending on the client. Uh, the Banana Republic factory with, with the arrow. All of these things are meant to make your email stand out in the inbox. And, and now that your inbox is getting flooded, especially if you are marketing to people uh, in, with Gmail, your inbox is not just going to be flooded with personal mails until you can figure out how to get your mails from the promotional folder into the primary folder. You're gonna be sitting next to a ton of other people marketing to your subscribers all with the same goal, to get them to spend money with them. So if your emails don't stand out, if they didn't stand out before, they're going to be just washed over in Gmail so much more now. So this, the efficacy of this has just shot to the moon with, with kind of this change that Gmail made. And again, Ryan mentioned this earlier, Gmail is not the only person making this change. In fact, Yahoo and Microsoft came out with their version of Priority Inbox before Google did before Gmail did. They just didn't get as much publicity from it and they didn't really give you too many options. They just did it. So these are some a few examples. And let's go through kind of how to use these subject line symbols effectively. Um, I kind of touched on this a second ago, but the, the first rule or best practice here is to select the right symbol, right? Make sure that your symbol makes sense. Uh, in this example, don't use a heart in a subject line about a credit card balance, right? No one loves hearing from their credit card company that you owe them $5,000 or that you're, you know, you missed your payment date. That's, there's no congruency in that message. Uh, the, the same subject line rules apply. Now, going back to what Ryan said, if you're having a shocking statement or if you're trying to grab attention, now that gives you a little bit more leeway um, with some of these symbols, like there's a, a skull and crossbone and, and all kinds of stuff that you can do if you're going for one of those really shocking statements or bold statements that you can use. But if it's, it either needs to be incredibly bold or incredibly congruent and don't mix the two, right? So if you're having kind of a benefit-based sub subject line, don't have a, an incongruent kind of shocking symbol in there because it's just gonna feel wrong. It's not gonna make sense. It may get opens or it may just get deleted. So here's some other really cool examples. Um, you know, weekly fare with an airplane. Again, the black stars and the hearts. Those are two of the most used symbols in subject lines. Now, they definitely work, but the black stars are starting to, to kind of lose a little bit of their, their oomph. So um, let me show you how to, how to find some symbols and, and even, uh, even more importantly, how to find some custom symbols for your subject lines. So believe it or not, the one place that you can go to find these symbols that has the uh, kind of the largest library is Wikipedia. So here's the link down here where you can go uh, wikipedia.org forward slash wiki forward slash miscellaneous underscore symbols. There are probably 
600 different symbols there and you see the unicode and the html um, and what it looks like right so you can just go through there i would suggest having your subject line first or having a couple of subject lines and then going to wikipedia and seeing what default symbols you can find that make sense the umbrella you can see kind of the third uh the third symbol there the umbrella has one of the the highest uh, open rates for some reason. I don't know why, uh, but a lot of tests show that if you can have it make sense, the umbrella absolutely works. So then you can go and actually search at emailstuff.org, uh, the URL's right there, if you have a custom kind of symbol that you're looking for that's not listed. So let's say you're talking about um, the end of a sale, right? So you have a 48 hour sale and you don't want to use the four and the eight like Tiger Direct did, but you want to kind of uh, convey that this is a limited time sale. A stopwatch may, may be a really good way to do that. So you can come over here to this site and search for stopwatch. And here it is, it's gonna give me the email subject line, uh, code for that, the HTML code, all the different codes, and it shows me what the little image is gonna look like. So there's no reason that you can't find a way to use these symbols in your messaging, in your subject lines, add that to what Ryan just said, and you're really gonna see a big lift in your email open rates. And, and as we go on today, you'll find out why that's so important. So standing out, uh, or I'm sorry, how, uh, how do these look in mobile, all right? So these are cool when they work, but I tell you what, when you do this wrong, and it comes up with just gargled, code that doesn't make any sense, it can really have the opposite effect. So you need to make sure that you're testing these symbols, not just in your different email clients, because everybody's going to interpret this code a little bit differently, which is kind of one of the, the barriers that you have to overcome on using these. Uh, if you've got a really clean list and you've got a robust system that allows you to segment emails based on uh, 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 your su subscriber's ESP, so you can segment out your AOL and your Yahoo and your Gmail and you can display different messages for mobile than, uh, than your, your desktop or uh, uh, email clients, you have no problems, right? All you have to do is a little bit of testing and you should be able to figure this out. Some of the codes will transition over and here's, here's an example down here. Um, you can see that, so the, the cross looks pretty similar from how it would look on a desktop client to how it would look in a mobile mail. Uh, the arrow arguably looks better than it would in mobile mail. The airplane the same. That airplane looks a lot better than, than the code uh, for that just kind of little black airplane. And then the sun, the same thing. So in some cases, a lot of these symbols look better in mobile, right? But in other cases, they just don't work. And not just in mobile, they, they don't work on certain uh, Hotmail or AOL or, or some of the older MSN. So you have to test these you should go out and create uh, seed addresses. Go create, if you haven't already done this, and hopefully most of the people on this, this uh, training have, if you have not already created a seed email address at every free email client out there, immediately after this training, go do that. And then put those email, uh, those email addresses on your email list. In fact, create a new email list for them and, and just have your seed accounts in there. So what you what you should do before you send an email, before you schedule your broadcast email, is actually send a broadcast to a list that just contains your seed addresses. It's different than sending a test mail uh, because depending on your email client, who you're using as your ESP, the test mails don't always look like the end result broadcast mail. So always have a seed address, uh, a list of seed addresses and send yourself a broadcast or have someone on your staff send you a broadcast before you schedule it to go live, even if you're sending the test mail. That's gonna let you know which of these symbols are working and which ones aren't. Hey, uh, Rich, real quick, if I can jump in and interrupt. Absolutely. We're, we're, we're getting a number of, of uh, questions coming in, guys. I don't want you to think that, that uh, just because we haven't responded to your question that you're being ignored, so please don't ask the same question over and over again in the comments box. We are going to kind of hang out uh, and, and do questions at the end 
just because we got so much to cover and we want to make sure we get through everything, okay? So again, feel free, ask questions, but uh, don't don't be offended if we don't uh, respond or acknowledge during. I just want to make sure that, that we're able to get through all the content in a timely manner. So sorry, go, take it away. Rich. Okay, so here's just another example, not to, not to beat a dead horse here, but here are three emails and you can see the difference in those emails um, and, and more importantly, the symbols in those emails on three different mobile devices, right? So you have iPhone, Android, and BlackBerry. Arguably, iPhone looks the best. Android would be second, although you can see that the, the little finger pointing uh, turns into a forward, uh, a forward in Android or it just doesn't show up. In BlackBerry, the same thing. So you have to test these symbols on mobile and different email clients to make sure that, that you're not totally dropping the ball and going from a subject line boost to a subject line open rate decline. Now, this is a big one. Don't overdo it, right? I see a lot of people, whether they're direct response marketers or even big companies that find something that works in email and just beat it to death. Unfortunately, one of the first companies that I saw really leveraging uh, these, these symbols online and, and in their email marketing was Travelocity. They did a fantastic job. They had a lot of the, the different rain, uh, the umbrellas and the, and the sun and, and different stuff like sunglasses for, for beach trips. And then they just decided that the little airplane was kind of their thing. When I was going into search for examples and I typed in Travelocity into my, my archive, uh, what I found was look how often they're using that airplane. May 29th, June 3rd, June 10th, June 11th. That's not a huge span in date range or number of emails that they sent me in that time period. Eventually, much like banner blindness ha happens when you're, when, you're, uh, when you're doing banner advertising online, the same is true when you're using these symbols. If you overuse them, the newness will wear off. So you have to use them sparingly and not only that, you have to switch it up. Make sure that, that they're either shocking or they're relevant to your image. And don't think of it like another from field, right? I know it's from Travelocity. The airplane's not their logo. I don't need them to use that to help me say, oh yeah, that's Travelocity. I trust them. If anything, it just kind of takes up a character they could have used for something else. So make sure when you start using these symbols... I can't think of any reason why you wouldn't get a, a boost in your open rates, but don't make it your standard operating procedure that every email you send or every other email you send has one because you'll will, you will see your email open rates drop right back to where they were. So let's talk about the results. Several, uh, several companies have gone online and published their results. You know, this is results from uh, a lot of large uh, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, um, and we've even peppered in some of our results in here. So, quick recap on results of using these these symbols in your subject lines. Subject lines with a, with symbols had a higher unique open rate in 56% of brands analyzed. So, 56% of the the big brands and uh, direct response marketers using this saw a bump in their open rates just by using these symbols. Like I mentioned earlier, the black heart is the most popular symbol, but because of that, now it only provides a slight lift in your open rate. The greatest unique open rate lift came from the umbrellas and the airplanes. Now, I would argue that Travelocity is probably not receiving that much of a lift anymore because they're using it in about every third email. The most popular symbols are the heart, the star, the sun. Uh, I guess I could list all those out, but I'm pretty sure you can see them. Uh, you can use multiple symbols, okay? That's something to think about here too. As you see all of these together, don't use too many, but it's really cool if you can make a message, make sense, and string a couple of these together. So let's look at one more thing. So Email Insights, and, and here's the URL to where you can find this. They publish a list of brands that they're watching over a month period, the total number of emails they sent, and the emails with symbols. So out of these brands that they're watching, these 53 brands, they've sent almost 1,000 emails that they've monitored in this time period. 20 of those emails, or 2% of them, had symbols in them. Now that, I don't know if that's the correct uh, kind of percentage to use in your marketing. You could probably get away with a little bit more, maybe up to 10%, uh, but it's really cool to see that the big brands that are being watched 
are using these sparingly. I would suggest you do the same thing. Uh, you know, the Tiger Direct, you can go down here and look at a couple of these examples. Uh, Tiger Direct's using eight desktops that rock. Office Max has the, uh, has the arrow. You know, Old Navy, the scissors probably work really well. Uh, Tiger Direct has the hot. Again, Tiger Direct using the two numbers um, in, their, in their subject line, the 72 hour sale. There's the, the star and the heart and the sun. So these things work, okay? You guys need to make sure that you're testing them not only for uh, for compatibility with these different ESPs, but also test them against the exact same subject line without one of these icons, okay? Don't just use a blanket result. Use A-B testing. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so sneak email trick number three is uh, we're going to talk about optimizing the preview. And don't worry, guys. These get, you know, some of the, most of these are a lot shorter than the, fir than the first two. Um, so for the, for the third sneak email trick, I want you to consider this concept of the second subject line. So here's a screenshot from my inbox. And uh, you can see there you've got the name field, you've got the subject line, which is in bold, and then next to it, you've got a little bit of a, of a preview window. So I'll zoom in a little bit more so you can see it. So there you can see you got, you know, you've got the, the main subject line that's bold and the preview window. Now, this preview line I like to think about it as a second subject line. It's like a subtitle uh, or a subheadline, and it's an opportunity to to market and show show people some additional information. But what a lot of people do, if you look closely, you'll see this on a number of them, is they have something like this in there. Click here to view this message in a browser. That is not a particularly good use of the second subject line, but it happens very easily. It's, re it's really easy to do this. We still today do this every now and then. Um, and it, it's because of this area right here. People have been told this is a, a best practice that you want to tell folks if you're sending HTML with, with images, you want to have a link at the top that tells them to click here to view this message in a browser window. In fact, a lot of email service providers put this in by default. Okay, it's just, it's there, it's by default, it just happens. Now this is good for clicks because if people are reading it on, on a device and they can't see it, then they can go access it elsewhere. It's, it can be bad for opens though, because like I said, you're not leveraging that second subject line. So a really easy fix to this is simply to put a line of text above the where you should view it. So this one you can see, it, they say in my latest blog post, I review seven different visual drag and drop WordPress content editors. Um, I would probably uh, not had in my latest blog post because that's not as compelling. I would probably just say seven different visual drag and drop WordPress content editors reviewed because that that's going to be a little bit more of a compelling, um, I, I think about it like a subhead, but still I like the use and it's a very, 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 very easy fix. You just put it right there above, above it. It kind of works as an introductory line and that's what's now going to display first uh, in the preview area in, in Gmail and Yahoo and all, all the other ones that have the preview, which is only about all of them now. Um, a more complex way to do it where they don't even see the preview text, you can literally have it be just about anything you want it to be. Um, can You can do it with code and spacer uh, GIFs and just going in and manipulating that stuff. Obviously, this is a little too technical to go in here, but there is a great article on a wild bit about how to do that. So uh, if you just do a Google search for how to get better email content previews in Gmail, you, this this article will come up. And again, the link is below in there. But this is definitely something to keep in mind. It's a huge opportunity for optimizing um, an area that most people ignore. And it's great for, for uh, increasing your open rates. Yeah, and if you want to know, there's the code to do it if you actually know how to mess with code. Uh, sneaky uh, email trick number four is delivery timing. The timing of your email delivery, and I'll tell you a story in just a little bit about how we actually figured this out the hard way. The timing of your email delivery is hugely, hugely important. There have been a number of studies about this, and it's one of the rare instances where you go across and you look at, at all the different studies the different email service providers have done, you know, research firms have done, and they all kind of agree that the best times to mail are 8.30 o'clock, 8.30, 8.30 o'clock, 8.30 <laughs> in the morning. How do you read o'clock? 8.30 in the morning and 3.30 in the afternoon. Uh, and ideally, if your email service provider will allow you to, uh, to detect what their time zone is, it would actually drip out these emails so that, so that it occurs there in, in their time zone. So they're getting it at 8.30 in the morning 
or at 3.30 in the afternoon in their specific time zone. Not all of them allow you to do this. You, you, uh, you know, need to have IP addresses and stuff so it can do a, a search for, for where they are. Uh, but check, and if your email service provider does, then it's, it's a good thing to turn on. If you don't uh, have, have this, then the, one of the best things to do is just to assume that these all times are Eastern because what you get if you mail at 8.30, um, o'clock in the morning. Do, wait, actually, I'm sorry. Do we hate 30 o'clock again? <laughs> wow. Um, do we mail? Let me, let me double check this, Rich. Do we mail at 8:30 a.m. Eastern or 8:30 Central? Central. We're, okay. We would mail at 9:30. Yeah. O'clock. 9:30 yeah. o'clock. Yeah. So we. So yeah. So correction. So 9:30 o'clock in the morning, Eastern. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is amazing. Nine. Nine thirty, in the morning, Eastern time. So that will get. Folks who are central at uh, at, at eight thirty, it'll get folks who are Pacific at uh, at, at six thirty, seven thirty, right? Six thirty. So again, I clearly you can tell I don't know how to tell time, but that's okay. So keep that kind of in mind as a general uh, as a general deal. What what we found, and I'll, I'll tell the story in a little bit. If you go too early, it can actually cut your open rates in half, and I'll show you why that is. Best days Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Mondays, it, it you know, kind of makes sense. Mondays, everybody's getting caught up and, and they're behind. On Fridays, people are cutting out. Weekends are overlooked by a lot of, of marketers, and it's a mistake because people check their email on weekends. I do. I mean, I, I think most people check their email on weekends. and But because most businesses don't mail on weekends because I guess they're not there to click the send button. I mean, it's like they don't know that you can queue these things up and they'll mail automatically. Wait, you can um, do that before you, can, you leave? You can send emails out into the future. It's amazing. Um, I know, right? So, but they are great. They're especially good for low dollar and lead generation offers, for impulse buy offers. Because while people do check their email on the weekend, because that's their personal time, they're less likely to want to invest a lot of time in reading long emails or, or you know, sales messages and things like that. But if you've got a sale that you want to run for the weekend, or if you want to drive people to a lead generation offer where all they have to do is, is opt in, weekends are great for that. Don't ignore weekends. The biggest advice that I can give you is to avoid the morning, what we call the morning purge. So there was a really great, um, it, it, I, I linked to this, uh, this infographic uh, that, that kind of went went over this. But again, we found these this data appearing over and over and over again. I've, I've zoomed in on the left-hand side to the chart. If you look here where it takes a massive dip between, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock in the morning, and really it peaks at about 8 o'clock in the morning. That's why we suggest mailing, you know, if you can hit people at 8.30 a.m., that's where you're hitting the peak. That's where the number of clicks and opens is the highest on average. So look at the open rate. 6.7% at 8.30 compared to sub 1% at 3 to 4 o'clock in the morning. Now, let me tell you something that we were doing. Previously, uh, until very recently, we were, um, we, we were managing our email service, which we still do to a large extent. But because of our technology and because of the size of our list, it was taking between 3 and 4 hours to mail our entire list. Uh, and and we're not going to have a lot of time. I can always already see people are saying, "What email service do you use?" I'll, we'll talk about that towards the end. If you want to know the, the different email solutions that we use, we'll cover that at the end. But um, the one that we were using in particular took about four hours to send out a broadcast to our entire list, and because we wanted to hit at that you know eight thirty to nine thirty time frame, we had to start mailing at around four thirty in the morning. Okay, that would get the biggest block of subscribers, the biggest block, and it you know it, it was a sacrifice that we had to make. It just it was what it what it was. It was a, it was a limitation of the technology, and and we had to do it. Recently, we switched to a to a solution that mails a list of you know 250, 300 thousand people in what a matter of minutes. Uh, yeah, full list, even with advanced segmentation and logic statements, it'll take a little less than five minutes to okay. mail. 300. A little less than five minutes. So we changed our technology, but we didn't change our SOPs. And so our, our guys were still mailing now at 4.30 o'clock. Wow. <laughs> they were still mailing at 4.30 in the morning. And, um, and 
And, and it, like I said, that was fine when it was taking four hours, but now when it's only taking five minutes, look at this. We were hitting right here in this trough, right here in this trough, what we call the morning purge. I want you to think about what do you do when you wake up? Most people, although time management experts will tell you you should not check email first thing in the morning, most people do. And think about how you check email first thing in the morning. It's a bit like how you filter through your, your junk mail, right? You've got a pile of mail and you filter through really, really quickly what's all the junk and you throw it away and then you go back to the A pile. So it's kind of an A pile, B pile thing. The same thing is happening right now with email. You wake up in the morning and the first thing that you wanna do is to purge out all the spam, all the commercial messages that you don't want. People do that right there first thing in the morning, they get it out of the way. So if you're sitting in their inbox first thing in the morning, you are going to be right there in line for that morning purge. You don't want to be there. You want to show up after they've done that morning purge. And if you're there between the 8.30, 9.30 o'clock in the morning, typically you're going to be okay. You're going to, you're going to be in a really good spot. Yeah, and real, real quick, just to kind of validate this, Ryan, after we were talking about this the other day, kind of in preparation for this, I went in and I did some, some searching um, and actually kind of happened upon it when I was compiling some, uh, some of the mobile data that we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes. Uh, interesting stat, 68% of people use their mobile device to sort through emails before they read them. Yeah. So you wake up in the morning, you sort on your iPhone, and when you get to work or after you have your coffee and sit down, that's when you, you kind of go through those emails that you saved. And, and you're right, you're hitting at that time. You know, when my alarm clock goes off, uh, unfortunately, I'm one of those people, I'm grabbing my iPhone within a few minutes after waking up, and I'm going in. <coughs> And I'm getting rid of all the emails that are just going to be a time suck for my day. And I'm, if anything catches my attention, I'm going to leave it there. Or if it's from someone I know I need to read it, I'm going to leave it there. And I'll address that when I get to the office or, or sitting at the coffee shop. Yeah, so if, if you show up after that has occurred, you know, again, following the scenario, you wake up in the morning, you knock everything out, you show up at work, and now you've got the email. Now you're in reader mode. Right. Right. If, if your email hits when they've entered into reader mode, you've got a much greater chance of, of making it. Um, so just to give kind of some, some quick, you know, tell a quick story and maybe poke fun of ourselves a little bit. We, like I said, we updated our technology but didn't update our SOPs. We were mailing at 4.30 in the morning. Said it right that time. We were mailing at 4.30 a.m., so that we could hit the biggest block of our subscribers between that 8.30 and 9.00 it was taking four or five hours. Now it's only taking five minutes, but we were still mailing at 4.30 in the morning. So everybody was getting it during this worst possible time. We thought when we switched over to this new email solution that it was hurting our open rates. What we actually discovered is our open rates were better than they had ever been. And when we switched to mailing at the correct time, we had the best open rates we had had before. So delivery timing is absolutely probably one of the most important aspects. Not Maybe not as important as the subject line, but right there underneath it. Um, sneaky trick number five is link placement. So now we're getting into the actual formatting and body copy of the email. This is pretty simple, guys. We're a big believer in, um, if you wanna have emails that get clicks, shorter emails are usually going to get higher click-through rates. So keep that in mind. We also like the idea of having three links in every single email. So you'll have a link right below the first line, a link kind of in the middle, and then a link at the bottom. You've got primacy, recency, you're hitting them wherever, you know, no matter where they are. And and Rich, I know you you have kind of a, a, a theory, not a theory, I mean, it, it's what we do, but you've kind of developed a process for um, which links should go where and why. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so um, real quick, the, the most important link is the one above the fold, right? And like Ryan said, we like to have three links. And the formula that I've kind of come up with and I've, I've had our guys test in, in multiple divisions and, and our different holdings is uh, the initial link should be curiosity, right? So you should make a statement, especially if you have um, kind of a curiosity-based subject line. You should make a bold statement and then give them a link. Grab that low-hanging fruit, those people that already knew that they, they were gonna click before they opened the email because your subject line uh, just, it carried all the heavy lifting. So your first link, right after the first line, in this case, it's, an, it's a, the picture of a, of a video player, which always helps. I know Ryan's gonna talk about that a little later. So first link is uh, curiosity. Then you should go in, if someone doesn't click 
Now, this is my theory. If someone doesn't click an immediately on the curiosity, that means your subject line and your initial bold statement uh, did not grab them. So you have to change the mechanism, right? You have to give them a different reason to click. If you're not, if you're not presenting it in a different manner, they've already said no once. They're still reading. So the next should be benefit, right? Go in and, and initially make a bold statement, give them an opportunity to click. Now tell them about the benefit they'll receive by clicking it. Make another, uh, give them another link, another opportunity to click. And then the third and final is usually scarcity, right? So you have curiosity, benefit, and scarcity. And when you do that, you're giving people three different reasons and three different mechanisms or psychological reasons to click your links. Your click-through rates on all your emails are going to go through the roof. Yeah, good stuff. So keep that in mind when you're writing your email copy, um, you know, having all those elements in there. Um, sneaky trick number six, we call the email uh, video fake out. So, and it's, it's the simplest thing in the world and we kind of did it by accident at one point. We wanted to just have an image in, uh, we, we were sending people to a video and so I was gonna take a screenshot of the video. I paused the video and then, you know, the, the play button appeared. I took a screenshot of it. And that email got some of the highest click-through rates that any email had ever gotten before. We also heard from customer support people saying, hey, the video in your email isn't playing. So people actually thought, even though it was an image, because it had the play button, people thought that the video was going to play in the email itself. Now this is a little bit tricky, obviously, but I mean, it really is just an image of a video. You know, I don't want, I don't know how to remove the play button necessarily. And I believe that as long as when they click on it, it's actually taking them over to that particular video. There's nothing unethical about it, but we saw the, when, when we do this, 120% click through rate increase. If we have, like if we're driving to a video and we have a screenshot of the video with the play button, and it's not as effective if you don't have the play button in there, because uh, they need a, a place to click, um, that gets us the highest click-through rate increase. Uh, we also did something recently where we, we were sending to a poll and there was a video above the poll that told people how to fill out the poll. And so not only did it have the, the, the play button in the video, it also had the radio buttons from the poll. Again, this got some of the highest click-through rates of just about any email that we had sent that month. Uh, and, and I believe it was the video plus the poll that made that work. Now, something you do want to keep in mind when you are using images and emails, whether they're images of a report, images of a logo, whatever image you're using, you want to make sure that you are using alt image tags. So just about every single um, email service provider that's got a little WYSIWYG editor in there that, that allows you to build the uh, that, that allows you to, to, to write out you know graphical emails anytime you upload an image it's going to have a little blank there called you know alt image tag and most people leave them blank that is a mistake because most um, email browsers most most email solutions like gmail have images turned off by default so here was an image that was in here was an email that was in my inbox and you could see here the entire top of the email was one massive image. One massive image at the top of the email. So the entire thing above the fold, it was nothing but what you see here, just a giant white box. Now in this case, they did use an alt um, image tag where it, it just said, meet, see you later. Now, what does that mean? That it's kind of pointless, right? That, that doesn't encourage me to display images. I don't even know what it means. All I know is I open this up, I see nothing. I'm probably going to delete it. I might even mark it as spam because I think that something's wrong with it, right? I might, some people it's gonna freak them out and think that there's a virus or something like that. So you wanna use these all, to, uh, number one, I would not use an image at that just the entire top chunk, the entire top half of your email that's above the fold is an image. I would not recommend doing that. There needs to be some text, because as you can see here, without displaying the image, there is nothing to compel me to read whatsoever. So if you're gonna use images, use them after a little bit of copy so that they're compelled to continue reading no matter what. Your, your message should make sense even with the images invisible. That's kind of best practice number one. Best practice number two is to use alt image tags, but don't have them be merely descriptive have them be an actual call to action. So you can see in this case, if we update the alt tag from meet, see you later, which I guess is the name of this particular theme that they're selling, 
to click display images to see this amazing photo or to see this amazing picture. Now I'm using the alt image tag as a call to action. It is telling the person to display the image. That is the best way to utilize the image tag. Don't just, you know, if it's, if it's your logo, don't just have the alt image tag be logo. Just say the word logo. Nobody cares. Have a call to action in there telling them to take the response that you want them to take. Big, big, big sneaky little trick there that works very, very, very well. Um, okay, here's the biggie. Sneaky trick number seven. Um, we are uh, well into this thing right now, and this is probably the reason that you showed up for this thing. This is kind of some of the newest uh, research and information that we have on getting out of the you know, the promotions tag, uh, tab and really just getting into all the different priority inboxes and engagement is the key there. So Rich, since obviously this is your baby, this is where you've been doing the bulk of your work, I'll kind of let you take over. Okay, great. Yeah, so again, this has everything to do with getting in the inbox, whether it's a priority inbox or a standard inbox, whether it's the promotions tab. Uh, engagement is carrying the highest weight of anything by uh, ISPs and ESPs on whether or not your email gets delivered to a, an inbox, a primary inbox, uh, a promotions tab, or straight to the spam box. So let's talk about the way that basic engagement is measured. Okay, It's measured by five simple metrics. Open rate, read rate, and this is usually determined by a lateral scroll. Um, so in some cases, depending on uh, on the length of your email, that could be hurting you. I know you get a lot of bang for your buck with short mails. Let me tell you something here that that I see that a lot of people who are who are uh, marketing products or services online have started to do, um, and they've actually done it for a while. After the end of their message, they hit return a lot of times. Okay. What they're doing there is pushing down their, their unsubscribe or their manage their subscription, trying to put it down so far that no one clicks it. One, come on, that's, that's kind of a little overkill, okay? There's, there's no reason to do that if you're, you know, if you're communicating with your subscribers in a way that you should. Two, that's not a good lateral scroll, okay? That's not the reason that you want people to scroll. If you're, what it's doing is it's making your email a lot longer and no one's scrolling. And the only people who are scrolling are the people that are so pissed off at you that they want to click unsubscribe. So keep that in mind if you are doing it or if you, you know, someone who works for you is, is putting those hard returns after the end of your message to push that down. Know that on top of just kind of being a skeezy thing to do, it's also hurting your engagement because of your lateral scroll. Okay. Now your click rate. How many people are clicking your emails? Your bounce rate. So hard and soft bounces. Basically, uh, when you send an email, what percentage of those emails are actually being delivered to an inbox and what percentage of them are bouncing back and your spam complaint rate, right? So that's great, but most of those elements can be solved with good copy, segmentation, and simple list hygiene, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. So where's the sneaky stuff? How does this help you get into a priority inbox? Well, Google is kind enough to tell you. They call it the importance metric, and here it is. If you can figure out this one simple equation down here uh, below this paragraph, then you're in. That's it. Just E equals, I don't even know how to say that equation. But that's it. So if you guys just do that, then you'll get through to the priority inbox. I'm not kidding. This is an actual section of a Google uh, document that explains the formula that they use to mark a message important enough to get into the priority inbox. Let's break that down into normal people talk for a second because if you're staring at that formula, that formula and you understood it, you're incredibly intelligent and you probably shouldn't be on here. You should be working for Google, uh, trying to block people that send emails like us. Gmail basically uses the same technology that they use to mark different uh, different emails as spam in your inbox as they do to predict which emails are important to you. They automatically determine importance by taking into account a number of things, including who sent the email. So if you email Ryan a lot or Ryan emails you a lot um, and you guys have a conversation, that email is automatically given points for importance. The next factor is terms, okay? For example, it, with me, 
even after the, the switch uh, to the Google or the Gmail tabs, I'm still getting a ton of financial newsletters into my primary inbox because I open a lot of emails about stocks and options and things like that. Those terms included in those emails, Gmail says are important to me, right? This is on a per subscriber basis. This is not a blanket rule. You're not, we're not talking about spam trigger words or anything like that. We're talking about individual subscribers. I open emails about golf and about financial, right? So even promotional emails or newsletter emails that are about golf or about financial matters are making it to my primary inbox. And I haven't done anything to move them over. Google's doing it based on my interaction with my inbox. So the actions that help determine which people and terms are important are replying, using stars, archiving, deleting, Obviously, messages that, that you're starring or your subscribers are starring are more important than messages that you archive, especially if you archive them without opening. All of this is done automatically before any human ever reads your email, any human being your subscribers. So how do you prove your emails are important? Now, we kind of went over this for a second. The first way to prove that your emails are important is to have a conversation with your subscribers. Now, what does a conversation look like? A conversation is you send them an email, they reply, or vice versa. Now, <coughs> that can be tough to achieve if you're sending broadcasts, but it's not impossible, right? When a new subscriber uh, opts in for one of your offers, especially if you're sending them um, a free report or a free video or some sort of freemium uh, in exchange for their email address, Here's a, a really good sneaky trick. Have the welcome mail go out and say, you know, hey, here's your, you know, here's your report on this. Do me a favor, reply to this email and let me know that you got it. Now, if you have customer service people, they're going to hate you. Okay? <laughs> know that now. It's nothing a good filter or an outsourcer can't fix, and you can't buy what it gives you. Now you've taken a transactional email and you've made it a conversational email, okay? I, I hope everyone understands that. You can also go in and, and going back to the outsourcer, pay an outsourcer or hire one customer service person if you're doing a lot of lead generation and you have a lot of new subscribers, new, new uh, prospect acquisition, hire one person, make it their job to reply to everyone that replies to that broadcast mail. If, they, if you email them, they reply, and you reply now, you have a thread, you have a conversation, and you cannot buy that kind of engagement. The next thing to do is to get subscribers to star your emails, to star them or to mark them important. A lot of this stuff can be handled through transparency and setting expectations during the, the, the subscription process. If, so, if you have a new subscriber, you it's your job to, to set the expectations on what they're going to receive from you. Not just frequency and how and who it's from, but also the importance of it. You, if you're an expert, if people are subscribing to your site or your brand because you're an expert, then you need to tell them that. You need to, tell, you need to remind them the importance of the email and the content that you're going to be sending them, and you need to ask them to do some things to make sure that they're receiving that content. Just like um, a welcome video would say, hey, your report's on the way, make sure you check your email, you can take that a step further and really leverage your brand and say, over the next X days, I'm going to be sending you some really powerful information on this. Or, you know, uh, you know, every blank, blank, and blank, you're going to get a new trick on this. Whatever it is, tell them what to expect, then tell them why it's important to them and where they're at when they, when they actually subscribed to your email list, what benefit it's going to provide and why they can't afford to miss it, and then ask them. So here's what I want you to do to make sure you receive this content. Go into your inbox right now. You should have an email from me. It looks just like this. Take a screenshot of it. I want you to star it. Then I want you to create a tag or a folder and go ahead and, and move that in there. And the next thing I want you to do is I want you to forward this email to three of your friends who you know would like this or it would help them if they're in a similar spot you are. 
So after they've stored your email, after they've created a tag or a folder, the next biggest thing that anyone could do to show that you are important in their inbox is to forward your emails to a friend. Think about it. If I recommend a service to Ryan, it's probably vetted. Okay, that's I'm, I'm giving my word, hey, this is someone good, right? If you talk to social media managers, the coveted thing for engagement in social media is how many retweets am I getting on Twitter? How many, uh, how many shares am I getting on my post on Facebook? It's the same here, especially when you're talking about uh, Google+. It's really the same there. Forward your emails. When you're getting into formatting of your emails, a lot of people... Uh, several years ago started putting all their social media icons in their emails, especially their newsletters and their HTML emails. One of the problems there is they only put social media icons that linked over to their social media properties, thinking that it would get them uh, more fans and they would be able to connect with their people across multiple platforms, which is correct. That's definitely something you should be doing. However, it they're not sharing your content. So if you're going to put social media uh, icons that link over to your different properties, use the footer of your email for that. Pepper in throughout your emails, especially your content emails, ways for your subscribers to share that email, both an email, forward to a friend. I, I, I cannot think of, a, uh, of an email client out there that I've seen that doesn't have the option to insert a forward to a friend uh, link in a broadcast or, a, or a, uh, an autoresponder message. But the next thing you need to do is you need to have share this on social media, especially with Google kind of pioneering these different uh, tabs and folders. G uh, Google Plus is going to be a big part of that. Social engagement uh, in email is going to be huge. So if someone is forwarding your emails, if someone is sharing them on Google Plus and on Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Dig, all of these different social properties, you're having a conversation with them. They went out of the way to star or mark your emails are important, and they even created a special tag or a folder for your emails. Now, be careful on the folder. You don't want people to go in and create a folder and then create some sort of auto rule that moves you over into that folder because you're defeating the whole, pro the, the whole point of this now. So tags in a lot of cases are better because tagging won't move you out of the inbox. But if you're doing all of these things, you're showing uh, Google or you're showing Yahoo or you're showing the, the different email service providers that their subscriber actually wants to hear from you, that you, your email is important and what's going to happen is you're going to slowly move over into their priority box without having to do anything else. So the bottom line is have good content. Tell people what they should do and tell them why it's important for them to do it. I know it's not the sexiest thing in the world, but that's what's going to get you through these different priority inboxes and, and these different tabs. Hopefully that got you everything that you needed to know on, on starting to, to get your engagement up. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Ryan now for uh, sneaky trick number eight, whitelisting. Yeah, and this is a really good transition because in this one I'm actually going to show you probably one of the best welcome emails I've ever seen that that act, that that you guys can model. You can't rip off. If it were mine, I'd say you could rip it off, but it's it's not. It's a, a friend of mine, and he's allowing me to, to show it with permission. Um, so modify it and make it your own, but it does exactly what, what you just talked about, Rich, um, and so they're going to get a great, great example. So the, the first big thing, and this is really simple, on the thank you page or in follow-up emails, just tell people, hey, whitelist us, and, and you can link them off. Here's, here's a, uh, a page on aweber.com. Um, that's how to whitelist us. You should have a page like this on your site that you link to in, you know, it should probably be down at the top of the emails and it should be really, really emphasized in the initial confirmation email, right? Telling them, go over here and whitelist us. Here's how you do it. Okay. So this is something that just a page that you need up as a general best practice on your website. It should be right up there just like you got terms of service, privacy policy. You need a page on how to whitelist us. This is a great one to model. Real, real quick, Ryan, sorry to interrupt. If you do a quick Google search for whitelist generator, there's two or three free services out there that all you really need to know is the name of your site, who the email comes from, the email address, and uh, IP addresses that your emails come from. They'll generate everything you see here with the pictures and broken down by the different email clients give you an embed code and allow you to put it on your site. So a quick Google search for whitelist generator, 
uh, can have this whole process done in less than five minutes. That was a great tip. Thank you for that. Um, also, the uh, Derek Halpern over at socialtriggers.com, he, he is very big about, and certainly during this Gmail thing, about hitting up his, his fans and followers on Facebook, telling them, look, you know, if you use Gmail, you got a problem. You're not going to get my stuff. And I love the positioning that he takes here. That's why, you know, read it. He's basically saying, I love it. This is bad news for you. He's telling them because of this thing, you're getting hosed. You're not necessarily going to get the subscription that you signed up for. So here are the steps that you need to do. And so I love that he's going out to his social media network and he's telling them, this is what you need to do to whitelist this because these are your biggest fans, right? The folks that not only are they subscribed to your list, but they're also following you on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. You absolutely want to go out with those. And I see him reposting this every few days. And it's something I would absolutely recommend doing. Maybe not every, he's doing it every few days because um, of the recency of the, the Gmail changes. But I, I would go out, you know, maybe once or twice a month and remind people, hey, make sure you're whitelisting our stuff. Uh, it, it's just... You're crazy not to. Um, but I, this is what I really wanted to show you. This is a, a listing inside of my Gmail account of all the different filters that I have set up. Now, I have blacked out a lot of the names to protect, in some cases, the guilty. Um, and some people that I receive their emails because I, you know, and I'm sure you guys do this too, right? You, you sign up for a bunch of of, uh, of email newsletters or, or you might some, sign up for somebody's list and they put out decent stuff. It's not they don't put out good stuff. It's just you don't necessarily want to read it all the time. You just want to archive it into different folders. And so that's what I've created. But one of these things is not like the other. If you look at this one right here, all the other ones are, you know, skip the inbox, apply label, swipe file, you know, skip the inbox, mark is red, apply label. Um, but then there's one that says, do this, star it, apply label, mark as important. There is one person, and I subscribe to a lot of email lists, but there is one person who has the honor of this particular designation. I star the emails, they get their own special label, but they don't, they're not skipping the inbox. They're still in the inbox. In fact, they're marked as important, okay? So even with these, these changes that, uh, that, that Gmail has made, he is still right there smack dab in the middle of my priority inbox, uh, even though he's sending out you know, mass email broadcasts. And his name is Andre Chaperon. He has a, a site called Autoresponder Madness, teaches this thing. But here's why I did this. I signed up for his list, and this is what I got. He said, you get a lot of emails, no doubt about it. Some of them get your attention, but most don't. I need your attention. I need you to commit to me and to this program. Um, and in this case, I had paid for it, so I was particularly incentivized to do it. Uh, he said, uh, but in order for me to deliver this massive value to you, I need you to play your part. You know the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Same applies here. Every email I will send, uh, send you will have a subject line prefixed with, so he's setting the expectation. Here's what my emails are going to look like. Here's who they're coming from, just like Rich said. Uh, when you see that email, hit your inbox, open it, and read it. Um, you get one bite-sized email from me a week. This is on purpose. Uh, he sets the expectation in terms of the length of the emails, uh, and then he goes into uh, the step-by-step -step of, next, create a special folder. Um, then read it. I mean, I fall like a lemming and I know what he's doing. I know what's going on. Like I, 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 I teach this stuff. We research this stuff, but it worked on me like a lemming and, and, and Andre's stuff is great. I mean, he, he, it's, it's justified to do this with his stuff. And, but I did it. I followed it. You know, there's lots of people who I think are great. Lots of people whose stuff that I, I read every time it hits their inbox, right? We all have those, those people that we look at that, that when their emails hit, we want to we wanna read it. Um, his is the only one that I do that with because he told me to. It's as simple as that, guys. He told me to do it. So this is absolutely the best welcome email ever. And there's nothing, the copy is good, but really it just came down to the specifics of do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. So tell them in the email, link off to the whitelist instructions. And this is another great way to make sure you end up in the priority inbox. Okay, sneaky trick number nine, responsive emails. Uh, again, Rich, we're back in your world, so why don't you talk about this one? Yeah, okay, so a couple of quick stats. Let's see, smartphones and tablets, we've talked about this a little bit, but those are now accounting for 20% of all traffic. Okay, on the internet, all traffic accounts for, is accounted for by, by smartphones and tablets. For us, it's a lot higher. 
There you go. Unfortunately, that number is drastically understated when it comes to email, okay? Email versus web browsing traffic on a mobile device. Because you can't forget about these. Remember, earlier when we were talking about best times to send, I said 68% of people use their mobile phone to sort through their emails before they ever read them, okay? Here's some other st stats. More emails read on a mobile device than on a desktop email client or via webmail. Stats say 44% of emails now open on a mobile device. 44%, almost half of email is open on a mobile device, okay? Year over year, we've seen a 132% increase in the number of emails being opened on mobile devices. <coughs> Do you think that's going to change, right? I don't, okay? The, the smartphones and tablets are outselling PCs, laptops, Macs, I don't care what it is, three to one. Uh, that that's not going to change. More people are going to read and at least more people are going to sort your emails on a mobile device. So if they look like crap, you're not doing yourself any service whatsoever. Let's talk before we talk about mobile friendly emails. And, and I, if it seems like I'm kind of going through this quickly, I am, um, because I can't, I can't really build a mobile friendly email right here. I'm going to show you, uh, some, some good best practices and some, uh, examples of layout. But before I do that, I want to give you a couple of shocking stats. Okay, so I wrote these down. I didn't have, a, I didn't have them in my presentation. 77% of people own a mobile device and able to receive their primary email. 45% of people never click on the view this email online from a mobile device. So a lot of best practices like Ryan mentioned earlier will have that view this email online. Um, and then they will have some sort of mobile detection script. And there's a good chance that even the, the best of the best and the top guys in this uh, are going to kind of miss the ball on the, the email when it comes to the inbox, but have that mobile detection script um, to where it's displaying a really clean looking version of their email if they click that link, but less than 45% of people. Uh, 40, let's see, 42% of people sometimes click. Here are the two big stats that should scare you. 70% of people delete an email if it doesn't look good on their mobile device. 70%. If you're sending emails that look terrible and that the formatting's awful and I'm having to scroll up and down and right and left, there's a good chance that I'm deleting your email and not just me, but your subscribers. 75% of people have negative perception of a brand from a poorly formatted or designed email, okay? With, with almost half of your subscribers of the total marketplace, and depending on the vertical that you're in, it could be higher, it could be lower, um, but as we move into kind of this, this mobile world, it's only gonna get higher, I don't care what vertical you're in, you need to start paying attention to this. So let's talk just real quickly about basic best practices for uh, designing your mobile friendly email. Designs should be simple. Remember, real estate on even the largest smartphone is limited. So use plain text or simple HTML. You can use HTML with text, use some images, but make sure that, that you're using some responsive images um, and really be mindful of that kind of above the fold real estate on a smartphone. Include a view mobile link in, the, in your header, but again, don't rely on that, okay? Don't, less than 45% of the people are clicking on that. So make sure that you have some mobile uh, friendly emails. Focus on making an immediate impact with your content and less on the overall design aspects, okay? You can use logos and you can use some pretty formatting uh, and still do well in your, in your mobile emails. A lot of it comes down to width. What's the width? Are you doing hard returns in your, um, in your text, in your line text? Is there a hard return? That's one of the things that I see done most often, and it looks terrible on my mobile phone, right? So emails uh, several, gosh, 10 years ago, uh, everyone said skinny emails, real, real thin columns are, are best. So keep your emails uh, real thin. So people started using hard returns. Unfortunately, if you don't choose correctly and you're using hard returns, on, and I open it on my mobile phone, there could be one line that's just a word, and it's a word from the middle of a sentence, and that's continued on the next line. 
that's terrible. The readability of that and the likelihood of me taking action based on that <coughs> type of, of content delivery on your part or on my part is slim to none. Now, invest in a mobile opt-in process. This is big. Uh, we don't really have time to go into it here, uh, but we, about a year and a half ago, almost two years now, I guess, invested in a mobile opt-in process, and it absolutely changed uh, everything in our in our subscriber uh, ROI. Right? It it from no more spend in, in traffic, it increased our opt-in rates. It increased the ROI of of all all of our media plays. Uh, if you're not leveraging a mobile opt-in process, uh, even if you do have mobile-friendly email, you're you're going to have some some issues because you're you're presenting something to people on mobile devices that's great. It looks terrific, and they click through to your site, and they can't use it because it's not mobile-friendly or tablet-friendly. Uh, normal lead pages, lead capture pages, and subscription pages suck for mobile users. So here's the source of a really great. Uh, infographic that lays out kind of at what should be your SOP for uh, generating a mobile email. So in larger fonts, have a call to action, uh, know your scale. So that's really important um, to know what iOS you're, you're working with. If you're using some of these advanced or enterprise uh, email service providers or email clients that, to send your emails, you're going to have a lot of options. Um, similar to to the the uh, so the service that we switched over to that Ryan was talking about earlier, not only can I when I create a broadcast, can I go in and say here's the uh, here's the standard broadcast, but here's the mobile variation. If I want to, and I look at my analytics, and I can see that most of my mobile traffic is coming from an iPhone five or even an iPhone three, I can go in and say. Here's my standard broadcast. Here's my standard mobile broadcast. However, here's a variation that's laid out for the iPhone 3 and the, the iOS that I'm using there. Um, if you have that ability, it's only going to pay off and, and ROI more and more in the coming months and years. So cut to the chase. Be obvious. You know, your layout, your finger targets. The, the, the most important thing on this entire infographic is finger targets. Not just from, from theory of, of the area where people are most likely to click with their finger, but also thinking about how large your call to action or your button should be. If you're creating mobile emails, the reason that most of them need to be graphics heavy is because people can't click a hyperlink very well. With, I know I can't with my fat fingers or thumbs. Give me a big button, right? Make sure that my finger target area is the most valuable piece of real estate, and I know that you're, you have a call to action and something large enough that I can click on it. So again, here's the source of this infographic. This is just a piece of it. I'd suggest you write this down and go check this out a little bit later on. That being said, I'm gonna switch it back over to Dice. Uh, this is something really cool. It's called Camouflage Promos. It's sneaky email trick number 10. And uh, take it away, Mr. Dice. Yeah, so, and this is kind of a basic one. So we wanna, the last couple have been very advanced, very technical. This one's pretty simple. Um, when, for the, for, for the most of us, I hope at least, you're not just sending out promotions, you're also sending out content emails. Now, I guess if you're an e-commerce company, there, there's not some, you know, as many opportunities for a pure content-based email, but most people, most marketers that I know and business owners, they're sending out both content and promotions to their email. We found that having a regular newsletter or a regular blog post that you post once a week increases open rates. The businesses that do it, that we have, get higher open rates than the ones that don't. I mean, is it like some statistically significant sample size? No, but we've never seen having a newsletter hurt open rates. So I do believe whether you do it as a newsletter that goes out, whether you do it just as a weekly blog post, you need to be sending out good quality engaging content that your people care about, not just updates on what you're doing in your business, you know, and stuff that nobody cares about, but real interesting engaging content at least once a week on a regular basis, it will bump your open rate. But when you're doing this, remember that you don't want your newsletter content, your free content to look totally different than your promotional content. In other words, you want it to kind of be your content promos, you kind of want to look like twins, 
right? Identical twins. And you want to look like these kind of twins, not these kind of twins. <laughs> now, I will give you an example real quick and, and kind of poke fun a little bit of ourselves. I mean, look, guys, one of the benefits to being a DM Lab member is not only do you get insight into our successes, you also get insight into, you know, our screw-ups. And recently, I found this. What you see on the left is the new newsletter design for our Survival Life newsletter. Um, and what you see on the right is kind of our standard email design. It used to be that our newsletters looked a lot more like the email that you see on the right, meaning they were twins. You couldn't really tell the difference between the content email and the promotional email. Then someone, I haven't figured out who, but some very well-intentioned employee, uh, probably a graphic designer, said, you know what, I don't think our newsletter is that pretty. I'm seeing lots of other newsletters out there that look really, really nice, and they designed, admittedly, this beautiful newsletter template that you see here. It looks very, very nice. It looks really, really impressive. The problem with it is, is it looks nothing like our promotional email. So now if I'm a subscriber, we've just made it very easy on our subscribers to know, oh, okay, I can ignore the emails that look like the ones on the right because those are commercials, and I can you know, only pay attention to the, to the ones that look like the ones on the left, right? You see this all the time. When advertising becomes ineffective, it's when it, it becomes obvious that it's advertising. You see this with banner blindness. You see this right now with people fast forwarding through commercials when they're recording things on their DVR. Um, the way that you get around that is through product placement, right? In, in, the insertion of, of advertising inside of the content, blending them together. This is something you want to keep in mind in your email marketing as well. Now, I'm not going to force you know, the, this team to go ahead and change it back to what it was before, but I am going to watch the data. Okay, I'm, I'm going to watch the data, keep an eye on it, and if we find that our open rates or our click-through rates drop to our promotional mails, you better believe that one of the first things that we're going to test is switching back to the original template that did look, albeit boring and not as pretty, that did look a lot more like the promotional ones that you see. And, and for those of you guys who are DM Lab members, you know, we'll update you on what happens here. But in general, as a control, as a best practice, remember, have them look like identical twins, not like Schwarzenegger and DeVito. Um, sneaky trick number 11 is something that is how you go about using Facebook to dramatically increase your engagement uh, via email to your subscribers. So if you haven't, I mean, obviously you've heard about Facebook if you haven't, wow. Uh, but what a lot of people haven't heard about with Facebook is, is a new feature in their advertising platform called Facebook Custom Audiences. So what you can do with Facebook Custom Audiences is you can actually upload your subscriber list to Facebook and you can build an ad campaign and market just to your email subscribers. Okay, so you're not going in there if you've, if you've dealt with Facebook ads, if you've managed Facebook ads in the past, you're not going in there and selecting you know, demographics or people who like things. You're advertising to your subscribers. And typically Facebook can match you know, anywhere from 60 to 80% of the subscribers to your list. They can match it because you have their real email address, at least the one that, that they're using for Facebook. Um, so what you can do now is tie your Facebook ads to your email promotions. So now when they're receiving emails from you, if the subject line of the email matches something that they saw on Facebook, you're effectively branding your email campaigns. So what is the what are the result of this? Well, we had a friend of ours test this out and do a true A-B split test. He had a list of 36,000 people, uh, and this was for an e-commerce site. A list of 36,000 people, and they were mailing uh, a, a brand new product. They had a brand new product line that was coming out, and so he took his list of 36,000 people, did a standard you know, just kind of nth name and, and split them up in half at random. Half of his subscribers got uploaded to a Facebook custom audience um, group where he just advertised to them about the promotions that they were going to be receiving via email. Of the leads that saw the promotion that were pre-seasoned using this Facebook custom audience, they generated over $8,000, almost $9,000 in sales. Of the leads that didn't, just $2,500. So the increase in sales was over $6,000 and the ad cost in Facebook was only $238. Now, had he uploaded his entire list, and I'm, I'm thankful that he didn't because now we have good solid data that, that, that I can report on uh, to you guys. Had he uploaded his entire list, 
the, this campaign, the, the results of this campaign would have been over twelve thousand additional dollars in sales, with you know maybe just under five hundred dollars in advertising costs. That is big. This is one of the best ways that we found. Almost nobody is doing it, tying social to email and really just branding, uh, branding your your customers before they receive your your messages. It's 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 no different. Advertising companies have been preaching this for for years. So let's say, well, if you're going to do a campaign, you want to do a radio ad, a TV ad, you want to do billboards. We're kind of doing the same thing, but in a digital environment and for way less money than you would spend on a billboard. So this is absolutely something you need to check out. If you don't know how to use Facebook custom audiences, um, we're building an execution plan for it inside of the Digital Marketer Lab um, uh, execution plan library. So you'll be able to see how to do that in there. Uh, we're also, uh, you can also do a Google search for Facebook uh, custom audience and, and it'll show you how to do this. But this is something, certainly if you've got a limited time promotion, if you're launching a new product, this is something that's worth investing in. Um, you can also, Go take your unsubscribe list. Now, this is a little, you know, this is a little bit of a sneaky trick. There's nothing, you know, unethical about it, but obviously you have people that unsubscribe from your list. It probably happens every single day. Now, these people aren't just gone. You know, they didn't vaporize into thin air and they didn't they probably didn't all of a sudden become completely disinterested in what you have to sell. It may have been you caught them on a bad day and they were just in an unsubscribe mode. Um, it may have been that they were interested, but not, then they weren't, and now they're back again. For seasonal items, that can be especially vital. If you're selling anything in health or weight loss, somebody might have subscribed in January. By the end of January, they're, they're, you're just making them feel guilty because they're still fat, so they unsubscribe, and then next year, coming back around, hey, they're, they're motivated again. So marketing to your unsubscribe list to try to get them to resubscribe or re-engage is another great way to use Facebook custom audiences. Obviously, you want to market to them differently, talk to them differently, but if they were interested in it, in what you had to say once, there's a good chance they're going to be interested in it again, and there's no reason to give up on them. Um, sneaky trick number 12 we call list mind reading, and uh, this is leveraging a pretty cool piece of technology that I'm betting you haven't heard of. Um, so, Rich, since you kind of handled this part, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to talk about this. Okay, so... Like Ryan said, this, there's a really cool piece of technology, and it's called Rapleaf. It's rapleaf.com, um, and basically what this is is it's a database that compiles uh, millions of data points, and you can upload your list and pay them for uh, additional data that you may or may not have. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that most of the data points that they provide, you're probably not going to have, uh, and it's really easy to use and, and one of the things that they've done is they've made it a very simple pricing model. So if you go to wrapleaf.com and you click on products and pricing and go to batch append, what you will see is this. Uh, they've got a nice little calculator here and, I'm, and for this example, I just went in and entered 100,000 email addresses and I selected one field. I said, I want to know one thing about these people. Let's assume for a second that this is my prospect list. I want to know their zip code. So for 100,000 emails, how much would it cost me to get their zip code? It cost me $350. Now, let's take a step back for a second and say, you know, why would I want their zip code? If you'll go back a few minutes or 30 minutes or, or however long it's been, <coughs> Ryan talked about inbox delivery time, right? So you don't want to be in the inbox in that purge time. Now, there's a, a really good way if uh, you're not able to capture the IP address or you don't have... Um, time zone information on your subscribers based on your current email uh, email provider, what you can do is you can take your prospects, you can upload them into Rapleaf, you can pay a penny per record, and you can get back a zip code. Then you can go and append those through a matching uh, software and convert zip codes into time zones. Make that a custom field in any autoresponder or broadcast client, re-upload those people, and now what you have is you have a segmented list based on uh, time zone. So even if you have to kind of MacGyver this thing or duct tape this thing together, what that'll allow you to do is go in and maybe you send three broadcasts tomorrow instead of sending one, but you go in and you say, hey, I'm sending the exact same broadcast, 
but I'm sending them to these lists differently because they're in different time zones. So this one's gonna go at, at 9.30, this one's gonna go at 8.30, this one's gonna go at 5.30, or however it breaks down. That's one really cool way to use this and make sure that your engagement goes up, that your open rates go up. All these things that we've been talking about can go up based on different data points on your list. And if you're not willing to pay a penny per subscriber for that, you really need to think about what the true ROI is of email marketing in your business. So let's look at some of the stuff that they have that we can get additional data points on. Hey, we sorry, are, sorry, can I, yes. I, I just want to jump in real quick. Um, we don't own or have any interest, what's vested interest in, in Rapleaf, you know, and we're not talking about this through an affiliate thing. We're showing you guys this because this is what we use. Right, I just wanna make sure that that's perfectly clear. I don't want you guys thinking like, oh, they're just doing this thing to pitch rapidly. No, we make no money by referencing this. We're just showing you guys what we use. So, there you go. Yeah, we don't, I don't even know who owns Rapidly. No. Okay. <laughs> very uh, very good distinction there. Uh, actually, I own Rapidly, and that just cost me a lot of money, so thanks. <laughs> to totally joking. Um, okay, so back to it. What are some of the things that we can get uh, data points on from Rapleaf and, and why should it matter? So I can go in and look at some data points and say, hey, I want to know people that are interested in blogging, what, you know, what books, what business, health and wellness, who is really interested in news and current events. These are all data points that I can get on my list for, again, a penny per data point per subscriber. Here's, here's the, the ones that I think probably matter the most, okay? So if I was going to map my list, which we do, um, the, the things that I would find most important would be the zip code for obvious reasons that we've discussed um, and probably household income, S especially if you have a range in product pricing. So if you have some very low ticket products and that's all you do, if you sell a lot of littles, it's probably not that big of a deal. But if you have a, a wide range of, of product offerings and you want to make sure that not only are you uh, not isolating or pointing out that certain subscribers can't really afford some of your services, but you're getting the highest ROI by only talking to the most qualified people, one of the things that I would do is go in and, and also purchase the household income. Then I would, I would make uh, custom fields in any email client and I would probably put them within ranges upload those back, and now I know that if I'm going to manage my marketing calendar and I'm gonna send out uh, promos that, that have a really high dollar back end, um, or if I'm gonna have any type of uh, expensive event or seminar to attend, that I'm going to probably at least test first to my most qualified demographic being people that have uh, more disposable income or a higher average household income. Um, but I can also look at things if I want to get just real psychological with it. You know, who owns a house? What are the presence of children? Does the presence of children make it more difficult to travel, right? Are they more likely to attend an online event than a physical event? If it's four days or if it's over a weekend, I'm cutting into family time of someone who has children. Um, what are their, I can go in and look at occupations, education levels, all of these things I can map for one penny per subscriber. Again, the arts and crafts, some of their interests here. Um, I think these slides might have gotten put in twice. That's my fault. I apologize. All right, going back. So, yeah, these things, you should have a kind of a goal of, of getting as much data as possible. But what Rapleaf allows you to do is not have 15 uh, questions that you're asking someone to subscribe. Now, there's a way to build this data up as well through... Uh, through different surveys, through questionnaires, through little micro commitments, and, and when it makes sense to ask your subscribers questions and append that data. But if you want to jumpstart that, go to Rapleaf. Rapleaf's not the only one out there. It's just like Ryan said, the one that we use. They also have something called uh, a real-time API to where when someone subscribes, you can actually get these data points. It gets it gets kind of advanced. Um, you know, we will be talking about this kind of in a different execution plan um, and at some of the live events we have coming up. But basically, you can you can live map uh, your list, set you know set certain criteria for new subscribers, and send them different places based on that criteria. Uh, it's very powerful for making sure that you're you have a, a a message market match, especially with with income and some things like that. So really compiling these data points on your list 
is only going to help you further achieve everything we've talked about um, on on uh, this this training so far today. That being said, I think I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Ryan. This is another sneaky little trick, and I think it's one of our last. So yeah, this is this is the sneakiest trick of all. This is this is one that admittedly is a little bit gray hat. That uh, you know, depending on the email solution you're using, they're maybe not even going to want you to do it. But I promise some, uh, you know, some super mega ultra sneaky stuff. So here you go. Use at your own discretion slash risk. So how many of you guys would like to virtually eliminate your spam complaints? Yes, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look in the comments, yes, clearly that's that's something that pretty much everybody wants to do. Spam complaints are, are, are things that can not only hurt our deliverability, depending on how bad they get, and hopefully you're not in this category, it can even cause you to lose your uh, email service provider account. So. Um, so one way that we found, and this is especially uh, possible to do if you are managing your own email server uh, to virtually eliminate your spam complaints is by using what we call the faux report spam link. So here is how this works. At the top of your email, you have a, 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 a link that is report spam and a link that is unsubscribe. This is one that you would create and that you would manage so that when somebody clicks on whether they click on report spam or unsubscribe, they are simply just reporting to you that they think your email is spam and at which point in time you unsubscribe them, okay? So instead of them reporting to you know Gmail or to your email service provider, they're reporting to you, the sender, you just set it up as a link and, and you can have it link over to the unsubscribe um, so they could still unsubscribe. Again, if somebody clicks that link, they need to be unsubscribed. Clearly, they don't want to be on, on your list, and you don't want them on your list, right? But this is a way. We know people who, who not spammers, I mean people who are legitimate email marketers who have added this to the top of their email and have watched their spam complaints drop to almost nothing. Because unfortunately, especially in consumer markets, people don't realize that when they click on the re report spam button that it actually has a very, very, very negative impact on on marketers and, and and they think that it's the same as unsubscribing okay if i click report spam then it, that's just like i'm unsubscribing no i mean you're you know you could really be doing some damage to someone's business and it's not spam i mean look if you're a spammer if you're harvesting email addresses and sending people stuff that they didn't subscribe to that they didn't opt in for you're a spammer and you deserve to be shut down but if somebody opted into your list to receive your messages and promotions you are not a spammer so when they click report spam you know, that is, it, 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 it's not true and it certainly isn't doing you any favors. Now, this is not something that we do in the vast majority of our businesses. I believe it is, you know, pretty aggressive. Like I said, it is gray hat. If you're using uh, a, an email, uh, an email provider like an Aweber or a MailChimp or one of those, they are not going to want you to do this. This is really for, you know, if you're at an enterprise level, you know, mailing hundreds, if not millions of, of subscribers at a time. It's also if you're in a market that, you know, is, is a consumer market and they just don't quite understand the difference between report spam and unsubscribe. So use it, like I said, use discretion if you are going to use this trick. I wanted to, I want, you know, we promised some sneaky tricks and I know a lot of them were just kind of general best practices. So we did want to have one in there that, uh, that you guys could, could really take and, and, and chew on a little bit. Um, so those are our 13 uh, sneaky email tricks. Now, one of the things that you guys had asked us for was what about list hygiene? Do you have a, a process or an SOP for, for list hygiene? So for clearing people off the list. Now, um, we, uh, you know, we've run on this, on, on this training, you know, way over. And, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that we delivered massive value to you guys. So, um, you know, I'll kind of take a quick vote. Would you guys like for us to go ahead and cover list hygiene really, really quickly? I think, in, you know, Rich can cover it in about five or 10 minutes. Uh, or would you rather us do it on a future uh, training? Okay, so, okay, we got a couple people that said, but it seems like the, yeah, the overwhelming consensus is that everybody wants us to go ahead and power through. So we'll make sure that we're definitely uh, off before the, um, you know, we'll keep it on the clock and make sure that, that we get you guys on your way. But hopefully you all agree that, that this has been valuable and that, and that you've learned a few things. Before, though, I turn it over to Rich to talk about uh, list hygiene. I did want to let you know we are doing an entire four-day conference just on email marketing. Uh, it's called Email World 2013. It's going to be in San Diego, California. September 23rd through the 26th, the actual Email World Conference 
is the 24th and the 25th. We have a bonus day um, uh, afterwards or before, I forget. We, one of the days is a bonus day where we're gonna be talking about um, email copywriting that's gonna be really great. And another day is a bonus day where we're gonna be talking about customer value optimization, how we go about how email fits into that, but how, how all that works. You can get information about this at emailconference.org, uh, emailconference.org. Tickets start at around $500. I will let you know though, that you can actually attend for free. If you are a, a member of DM Lab at the professional level, okay, if you're a member of DM Lab at the professional level, you are um, uh, eligible to come for free. You, you receive a season pass to all of our events, including Email World. So just real quick to, to kind of tell you guys what uh, Digital Marketer Lab is all about. Um, as a Digital Marketer Lab professional members, you get access to our execution plan library. We've referenced execution plans a number of times on this training uh, that, that we do today. Execution plans are not trainings, actually. Execution plans, think about them more like checklists on steroids. Okay, with, with the execution plans, they simply go through step by step by step by step and tell you exactly what to do. So if you don't want to like sit here and learn for, you know, two hours on how to, how to do this stuff, like what we've, like what we've done today. And instead you would just rather receive a checklist on how to format emails. If you would rather receive a checklist on, um, how to write subject lines that get opened. You know, if you, if you want, um, a specific checklist and standard operating procedure on how to do list hygiene that you can hand off to someone else, what we do is we compile all of these execution plans, all of these SOPs that, that we create internally into, uh, into the execution plan library. And you can go and you can access it uh, at, at any time. You can have your team members access it if you just want them to do it. And again, it's not extensive teaching and education on the hows and the whys. It just goes step by step by step. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. You'll get this result. So if, if that's kind of more your, your speed, then that this is the biggest value you can get out of, out of a membership in DM Lab. We also do uh, uh, what, what we call what's working now meetings. These used to be for employees only um, because we are a, our, our, our main offices are in Austin, Texas, but we have team members all over the country um, and, and some actually outside of the U.S. as well. So with uh, this was an opportunity for us just to kind of get together in a virtual meeting and have what we call kind of the, the wicked smart contest. Everybody shares their ideas and, and cool things that they're seeing that's working. And, and so kind of as a process of open sourcing the business, which is really what Digital Marketer is all about, it's about taking all of our different businesses and, and opening the kimono. Um, we are now allowing members of DM Lab to sit in on these, you know, formerly employee only meetings. There's lots of great stuff that comes out of it. Um, we share things before they get turned into execution plans. And uh, so that's a tremendous value. We also have weekly office hours times. So we have had a lot of technical questions come, come through during this training, a lot of technical questions that, you know, just I'll, 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 be, I'll be frank, we're not gonna be able to answer um, the vast majority of them. Uh, we just simply don't, don't have time. For members of, of DM Lab, however, you are able to call in during specific times during the week and someone from our team will be on the line and they will be there ready and willing to answer your question. Now, they may not have the exact answer to it, but they'll find it and they'll get back to you. So as a member of DM Lab, if you have a question and you don't get an answer, uh, the promise I'll make to you is it's because you didn't ask. All right, so that's a huge, huge, huge value. I mean, if, if you've ever sat there and just thought, God, I, I could move forward on this project if only I knew how to do this or if only I had a resource for this thing or, if, you know, I'd really like to get somebody's input on this headline or, or this, you know, th this product angle or brand name, you know, we're, we're here for you. That's a service that we provide to our lab members. You also, like I already said, get a season pass to all of our events, including the Email World Summit. Now, uh, subscriptions in DM Lab at the pro level, which is the level that you need to be at if you're going to have the season pass and have access to the office hours starts at $97. So it's kind of up to you. If you think that you're going to come to uh, email world, um, you would be far better to join as a member of DM lab and, you know, come on out for free, or you can pay the $497 to come out and as a non-member, you know, obviously we're encouraging membership. We want members there. We want people who are involved in the community um, and in the place that we're really creating in this in this uh, digital marketing space. So uh, 
to become a member or just to get some additional information if you want to see you know what does the execution plan library look like you know what do these you know uh, checklists on steroids look like what's the technology that we're using behind them um, go over to digitalmarketer.com forward slash join dash us digitalmarketer.com forward slash join dash us you'll see you know a video of me there talking to you about everything that's in it see some demos um, of the DM Lab members area, how it works, get some further explanation about you know the what's working now meetings, and the office hours, and how all those works, and of course um, the season passes because not only is it is it email world, but also if you're a regular attendee of Traffic and Conversion Summit, uh, and you know I know a lot of you guys are because we literally have thousands of people come out to that event every single year. Uh, if you've paid you know five hundred, a thousand, two thousand dollars, depending on the the tickets that you purchased to attend that event in the past. Again, yeah, now as a member of DM Lab at the new professional level, you get to come to Traffic and Conversion Summit for free. So obviously, if you're going to come to any event that, that we're putting on, it makes sense just to be a member. And like I said, even if you don't plan on coming to any events and you don't plan on uh, attending any of the What's Working, What's Working Now meeting and you don't plan on calling and ask, us and asking a question, it's worth it just to have access to the execution plan library so that you can just dig in get things done and, and move on or, you know, hand them off to your, to your team or a staff member and outsourcer to get things uh, done. So uh, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the membership that we offer. I know our members enjoy it quite a bit too. We're adding a lot of things from a community aspect uh, in the coming month or so that I know you're going to want to be involved in. So digitalmarketer.com forward slash join dash us, digitalmarketer.com forward slash join dash us, get you access to the execution plan library, the What's Working Now meetings, you know, call-ins to ask pretty much any question related to marketing that you can think of, and season pass to all our events. And I hope, my gosh, if you're still if you're still on, I mean, if you've hung around for a couple hours to hear us talk about email, um, and you're not out at Email World in uh, in San Diego in in, uh, in September, you know, y- you got to be there. You need to have somebody there. Uh, we're going to cover you know, even more than we've had a chance to talk about here in much, much, much greater depth. We're also going to have, you know, folks from a lot of the major uh, uh, email service providers that, that have data that we don't have because they, they're dealing in, you know, tens of billions of emails that, that they can track. It's going to be a phenomenal event. So you're going to want to come. And if you want to come, there's kind of no point in paying full price. Sign up for a member and, and come out for free. You know, we, we love our members and we want to meet you and, and shake your hand and, and, and say hi. So uh, digitalmarket.com forward slash join dash us is where you can get the information. And um, with that, you know, little commercial out of the way, Rich, I will turn it back over to you uh, by popular demand for List Hygiene 101. And just if you can talk about like, you know, what really, what is List Hygiene? Why is this important as kind of a lead in? Sure. Yeah. List hygiene. One of the sexiest conversations in uh, email marketing, <laughs> <laughs> right? Unfortunately, it's it's a necessary evil. And and I want to kind of get something out of the way that, that's kind of one of my, my pet peeves just right on the front of this. If if you're an email marketer, if you're, you know, if you're selling stuff online and, and what defines you is the size of your email list, um, you need to get over it. I, I hate to tell you that. If you're comparing email list size, um, you have a problem. The The first problem that you're going to have is you're not going to get in any of the priority inboxes. It's not about having a, a half a million person list or a hundred thousand person list or, or it doesn't really matter what the <coughs> size of your list is. It's how responsive your list is, both from an ROI standpoint and from uh, uh, getting in the inbox standpoint, if you, you know, if you are sending to a bunch of subscribers that don't exist anymore or have been inactive on your list for so long that Gmail and Yahoo and and all of these other email clients have long since moved you to the uh, bulk folder or they're immediately archiving your messages that's actually hurting your ability to get into not only the priority inbox, but just the regular inbox with subscribers who do want to hear from you. So what is list hygiene? List hygiene is cleaning up your list of inactive uh, inactive subscribers, 
Uh, it's it's re-engaging in active responders before the cleanup process. It's removing bad email addresses. It's basically making sure that that you're sending to real email addresses uh, of people who want to hear from you, and you're trying to re-engage the people who maybe fell off um, somewhere along the way. So I want to look at kind of the top uh, nine, I think it's nine types of email addresses that you need to, to remove. And we're going to start out with being uh, very passive. So we're not going to be aggressively pruning your email list. I know that this is a subject that people kind of tense up when I start talking about, you know, deleting anyone from their list, because I understand subscribers are hard to come by. If you're, if you're paying, uh, if you're doing a lot of paid media, you, there's a dollar amount associated with the acquisition of each subscriber, uh, albeit real or fake. Uh, but you're gonna have to let them go if you if you want to make sure that that your real subscribers, that the people that want to hear from you, are uh, are gonna receive your email. So the first type of email that you need to get off of your email list, and and for 90% of the people on this this training right now, this isn't gonna be a problem. It's duplicate email addresses. Most of the the email providers out there, most of the services that you're using. Uh, to send emails are going to have uh, an auto dedupe, especially at the list level, right? But if you have multiple lists, you're going to have some uh, some duplication across those. But again, even if you're sending broadcast to multiple lists, uh, most of your your email solutions are going to only send one email to to each subscriber. If you're using kind of some outdated uh, technology, you definitely need to make sure that you're pruning and deduping your list as often as possible. Um, you're not going to get any, no one's going to open the same email twice. And if they do, I hate to tell you their main reason for doing that is going to be either to unsubscribe from your list or to mark you as spam. So if they do open and give you uh, a couple of points for engagement, they're going to immediately take those engagement points away or negate them completely by marking you as spam or unsubscribing typos. This is a big deal. A lot of the times these are honest mistakes. People have, you know, misspell the their email address. And, and most of the typos that I'm talking about right now are, you know, instead of AOL, it's ALO and Yahoo is spelled Y-H-A-O-O.com. Um, there's actually some services out there and you have to be careful uh, using some of these, but there are some services out there that you can run your list through and it will <laughs> identify all of these typos in kind of the, the default URL, these little known typos, and every uh, variance of, A of AOL or Yahoo or Gmail spelled wrong. Um, and it will it'll export you a file with them fixed and you can choose to uh, upload it into your email client or not. You have to be careful that doing that. Obviously there's some liability there um, with some, some can spam, uh, you know, whether you have the right to technically email this person or not. Uh, because you're just assuming that they subscribed and, and accidentally typed that in. But the bottom line is having typos on your list, they're not going to get delivered. We talked briefly for, for just a second about unknown email addresses or bounces, right? Hard or soft bounces. So an email that you send that comes back to you as an unknown email address. That counts against you in your sender reputation and your sender score. Uh, and there's no way that bad email addresses can be engaging. So you're losing points. It, I'm not telling you to go out and clean these lists and put them back in with the misspellings corrected. I am telling you to, uh, worst case scenario, get them off of your lists. Uh, the third email uh, types of email addresses that you need to remove from your list right away are fake email addresses, right? Um, 123 at AOL.com, email at email.com. Uh, you know, I we have one, I don't know if it's the same person, uh, it's been blocked for a long time. I don't know if it's the same person or or if it's just, you know, kind of uh, a lot of people who've had the same idea. Steve Jobs at Apple.com has subscribed to our list so many times. I, I It's mind-boggling. Um, that's not a real email address, at least not anymore. And there's definitely no way that, that even during the heyday that Steve kept coming and subscribing to our sites. It's people who are wanting your freemium that are entering fake email addresses. And the worst thing that could happen there is those fake email addresses aren't fake email addresses. They're actually a real email address, just not the person that signed up for your 
<laughs> for your uh, newsletter. That's hard to figure out. Uh, but in this case, Steve Jobs at Apple.com may have been a real email address. The Apple employee responsible for checking about that email was probably pretty pissed off when we emailed it, right? That person knows that there's no way that that was a, sub a new subscription that was started and probably immediately marked us as, us at, uh, as spam. So the four, bouncing, uh, bouncing addresses. There are two types of bounces, and we've talked about that, you know, touched on that briefly, hard bounces and soft bounces. Okay, a hard bounce is a is an email that is sent back with a code that it's it's a permanent block. It's not going to ever get through. The email address is invalid. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, that's a hard bounce. Hard bounces should be immediately removed from your list. If you're managing your own mail server, uh, you can do that uh, with a with a lot of solutions out there. Um, a lot of the managed mail solutions, like your uh, Mailchimp's and your uh, exact targets and, and eye contacts and a Weber's they're going to manage hard and soft bounce uh, removal for you now that can be good and that can be bad you're using their IP so they're going to uh, err on the side of caution and be uh, overly aggressive with removing these bounces from your account because you could negatively affect other people on those IP addresses if you're managing them yourself, you can choose to be a little less aggressive, especially with the soft bounces. Uh, the hard bounces, it's, it's a pretty hard line. They should be removed immediately. Um, if I, I really can't get into the, the technical processes of, of going in and doing bounce removal. Um, there's a great company, Email Delivered, that, that can help you out if you're managing your own mail server. Uh, it's not something I suggest taking lightly, uh, but, but you can check them out. Alias email addresses is the fifth type of email address that you should remove. Um, so any any email address that's obviously not a person. You can see a lot of these in uh, webmaster support. Now, kind of tread lightly here. I know that that some people actually do subscribe with webmaster or or support at, but nine times out of ten, real people don't use those email addresses. Right? Um, those email addresses are scraped a lot and are used by spammers, okay? Um, what a lot of these removal processes are doing on top of just uh, bettering your, your numbers, it's also showing the ESPs that you know what you're doing, that you're not a spammer. If you act like a spammer, then they're going to uh, deliver your email accordingly, like a spammer. If you walk the walk and talk the talk and do these things that you're supposed to do, they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt that you're a, a permission-based email sender, right? So uh, alias addresses, maybe a little bit more aggressive, but definitely you can uh, sublist those and look at them on a more individual basis. Uh, but if anything's you know apparent, webmaster at apple.com, uh, webmaster at ebay.com, things like that, probably not a real address and should be removed from your account. Uh, fake addresses, again, uh, especially fake addresses with profanity or um, that obviously don't exist. Screwatyou.com is one of the uh, only ones that, that I've seen on our list that I even feel comfortable saying here in an open forum. <laughs> um, they've, there are some pretty creative people out there um, and, and some real vulgar ones too. So if, if you have, obviously, fake addresses on here, especially if there's profanity, um, no ESP thinks that that you know there was a uh, confirmed opt-in at screw at you .com, Okay, so make sure that you're removing these obviously fake addresses. Unsubscribes. This should go without saying, but just in case, I know we shared a little little uh, sneaky trick on how to market to your unsubscribes through Facebook using custom audience. Just to be clear, that's not sending emails. That's showing ads to them when they're browsing Facebook. Do not mail your unsubscribes. Um, it, it, there's nothing good about it. I can go into it a little bit more, but I feel I shouldn't have to. Just don't do it. Um, all spam addresses. If an email address exists in your database that has the word spam in it, don't email them. Someone put that there. I don't have an email address spam at digitalmarketer.com that I would subscribe to anything with. Um, so that's it. Those are the eight. Wait. I believe eight, there may be one more. Yes, inactive subscribers. Okay, this is actually the biggest one. I'll breeze through this really quickly. Uh, we're gonna talk about this a lot 
at the upcoming email world event, but inactive subscribers. There are kind of some milestones here. If a subscriber hasn't opened one of your emails in six months, they should be moved to an activation campaign. And really, that is waiting a little too long. Your checkpoints, your milestones for inactive subscribers should be subscribers that have not opened or clicked an email in 30 days, three months, six months. At 30 days, assuming you have the technology, you should move people that have not opened or clicked an email in 30 days, have them automatically triggered to receive an uh, activation campaign to, with the whole goal of getting them to open or click an email. Um, so what is what does the activation campaign you know look like? I mean, what what types of things? Is it just like, hey, we noticed you haven't opened anything, so click this, or we're taking you off, and what do you do? Yeah, um, so pretty much, I mean, for the most part, it's it's that. Um, you know, we miss you. Are you okay? You can you can get cute with these. One of the best activation campaigns I've seen in a long time uh, was actually from LinkedIn. So I was, um, I was on a number of groups in LinkedIn. Uh, I never checked them. To be totally honest with you, I don't know how the hell I got signed up for these groups in, in LinkedIn, but my God, anytime anyone made a comment, I got an email alert. I knew that it was probably something I did, didn't have time to go in and, and unsubscribe, uh, but they sent me an email after a, a, a while of inactivity saying, you know, hey, we're, we're going ahead and preemptively removing you from this list because it's obvious that you don't want it. If you do click here, uh, it was laid out a lot, you know, obviously a lot better than that. But, but the main point is you should contact these people. You know, is everything okay? Uh, we miss you. Haven't heard from you in a while. You know, hey, Ryan, I noticed that you haven't been opening or reading our emails in the past 30 days, and I want to make sure everything's okay. You know, is there a better email address? Because a lot of the times that, that, that can be your culprit. People change email addresses. They're free, right? I still have my email address from college. It's taken me years to move over the emails and the subscriptions that I actually care about to my primary email address. But had people made it a little bit easier on me, I'm fairly certain I would have, again, at least the ones I care about, I would have moved over a lot faster. So, hey, uh, hey, Ryan, notice you haven't been opening your email address or your emails in the past 30 days. Is everything okay? Uh, if you have a new email address, feel free to update it here. Want to make sure that, uh, that you're getting these. And you can put them in a series and get a little bit more aggressive as the series goes on. Uh, one of the best ones that I've seen... Uh, and I believe it was, no, no, I honestly, I don't remember whose it was. It said, you know, it is today goodbye, you know, and it basically said, you know, hey, Ryan, I've been sending you emails for the, for the past three or four days because I noticed that you have not been opening my emails um, and, and really uh, consuming the content I've been sending you over the past month. So, you know, I told you that, that I was going to go ahead and remove you from the list, um, inactivate you. Uh, you know, if I hadn't heard back from you, unfortunately, today's kind of the day. If, if I don't hear back from you today, uh, if you're not clicking this link, I'm going to go ahead and, and move you over and stop sending these emails because it's obvious you don't want them. You can choose to be as aggressive or as passive as you want to be, but the bottom line is mailing inactive subscribers affects um, everything. It affects your, your engagement by a lot because, again, think about your open rates. If you're being honest with yourself right now and you say you have a list of 100,000 people, what's your list really? What's your open rate on 100,000 people? What do you think you have active in real email addresses? What do you think your open rate and your click rate would go to if you stopped being so caught up in list size? Now, I'm not casting the first stone. I have a number in my head right now, and it's not particularly pretty. But it matters. It matters now more than ever. So if you're not doing these simple purges and really moving quickly to, to some of these more advanced email purges, you're going to have problems getting in the, the priority inbox. And very soon, you're going to have problems getting them into just the regular inbox. Um, I think I'm going to have to stop there. We're, we're over kind of... I know I'm way over my time on this. I definitely didn't do that in five or ten minutes. I apologize, Ryan. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Yeah, and, and, and I mean that, that that that's great stuff, and this is important stuff. And so I, I you know, I, I think that it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't think there's any need to apologize. And, and based on the comments and feedback that we're getting, I know everybody really appreciated, especially that last part. People need to hear that. You know, in this case, size size is not what's most important. Um, 
what I want to do now, I'll go ahead and answer a couple of quick questions. I was writing down questions as they were coming in because they were kind of coming in faster than I could than I could scroll. And one of the ones that that I wrote down early on was related to, uh, you know, do you do double or confirmed opt-ins? And we actually, as a company, do not do uh, double opt-in or confirmed opt-ins. There are some email service providers that will require it. We do not because we are so diligent about what Richard just talked about, which is list hygiene. If you are not going to do list hygiene, then you probably should do uh, you probably should do double or confirmed opt-ins. In our experience, our data shows that if we do confirmed opt-in, we make less money. It's as simple as that. If we do confirmed opt-in, we make less money. Does that mean that occasionally, you know, we get the occasional, you know, screw at you.com? Yes, it does. And you know what? That's why we have list hygiene. Um, uh, uh, SOPs in place to make sure that we get those people gone. I would much rather, you know, build, you know, build my team and build our systems and our execution plans around doing that than do something, you know, that I would consider to be somewhat extreme, which is somebody subscribes and you're telling them, hey, you know, subscribe again, essentially. Um, and and like I said, our our data shows that we make less money if we do confirmed opt-ins. I would much rather do just single opt-in and be very, very, very diligent about list hygiene. Um, like I said, it, I, I don't think single versus double opt-in is never going to make or break a business, right? We're, we're talking about details there. So different. there's lots of opinions about that subject. Uh, I'm going to go ahead for the sake of time um, and, and leave it at that. Uh, you know, <laughs> another question that, that came on early is, you know, how worried should I be about uh, Gmail's, uh, the, the Gmail promo tag and, and what they're doing with Filtering Rich? What, what is your opinion on that? Should, should, people be, should people be worried about it? I, I wish I had a different answer, but yes, you should be worried about it. And if this is the first time you've heard about it on this, uh, on this train, then you should be very worried about it. Um, but, but really, it's, it's there, right? Um, we're going to figure out and, and continue testing and, and sharing with uh, our DM Lab members, uh, all the results. Obviously, this has just been rolled out. Um, the engagement, uh, things that we've talked about, are going to have a huge impact on the priority and the tab. Like I, like I mentioned in the that part, I still get direct promotional emails, newsletters in my primary uh, tab that I have not moved over based on my uh, engagement with those mailers. Okay, so that's a tactic that works. However, again, if you have an unsubscribe link in your email as required by Can Spam Act, then that's kind of a pretty good indicator for Google that you're, you know, you're a, a promotional, transactional-based emailer. There's a lot of stuff that you can do with with segmenting and engagement <coughs> to to kind of declassify yourself as. Uh, as a bulk emailer, and that's some you know cool stuff that that we just don't have time to go into here. That we'll be talking about at email world. But the bottom line is, send good content, have best practices in in telling people what to expect, and and follow up and, and do that, and you'll probably be okay. And we're gonna figure out some really cool stuff along the way because we just make too much money sending emails not to, and this is kind of what we do. And hopefully you you'll Take us up on our offer to join us as a as a DM Lab professional member, and and you'll get those insights um, when we have them. So, but but yes, as now you should be um, uh, at least mildly concerned about the the new Gmail tab. Yeah, and, and I would agree. I'll, I'll put a slightly different perspective on it. Um, I think you should be, you know, concerned from a responsible, just as a responsible, you know, business owner or, or marketer, or you know, if you're if you work for somebody who generates. A significant portion of their leads, you should be worried for them as well. But it, this isn't a time to, you know, bury your ha head in the sand, proclaim the sky's falling, and freak out. Right? I'm seeing a lot. I'm actually seeing people do that who I wouldn't have thought would do that. Th we've had things like this happen before. You know, we've had things come and things go and things change. Uh, what it is is, I mean, it's it's it, it winds up, you know, kind of sadly, not to not to be too curt about it, but I mean, it, it winds up weeding out the little guys. It winds up weeding out. Those people like you who you know who aren't willing to stick on to a to an online training about email for over two hours. You know that's why I think it's great that you're still here, and that's why I think that you and your business, your company, y'all are probably going to be just fine. 
uh, because you're going to take the steps necessary. Um, I think at the end of the day, what we're going to see is a a short-term drop in open rates and click-through rates as people figure out how it works. If you're if you offer something of value, I think you're going to see those return, maybe not to the levels they were before, but I bet you wind up seeing the conversion rates being just about the same. So the people that are, are excited about what you're doing, they're going to find your emails. You know, the, the priority inbox has been around for a while now. There, there's been, you know, software and tools like SaneBox that have been around for a while now. Um, I use them and, you know, I, I find that I, I wind up going to the filters I create to read stuff. Who Where I really think it's going to hurt are... The, um, the deal of the day type sites like the Groupons of the world where you know an email goes out and somebody needs to take action on that email that particular day. I think what you're going to wind up seeing is the performance of your emails is going to be spread out over more days. So whereas you used to send out an email and you might get 80% of the results that you're going to get for the first you know 24 to 48 hours, it might be you know that it takes seven days to get those same results because people are going to consume it at, at their own rate. Whatever it winds up being is what it's going to wind up being. Um, and we all need to, adjust, to just adjust the economics and our, you know, and our actions to, to account and you know, know that, hey, at the end of the day, when all this shakes out, there's going to be less competition. It's just how it works. And, and I hope that you're one of the ones that's still around, and I hope that we're part of the reason that you're here. Um, I will say again, you know, if you haven't gone over to digitalmarketer.com forward slash join dash us to check out what DM Lab is all about, we had some folks ask about email copywriting. I know uh, if it's not this week, if it hasn't already gone up, it's either going up this week or next week. Uh, it'll go up very, very soon. We the, we are um, adding uh, an execution plan to the library that is on email copywriting. We add a new execution plan once a week. So there's always something new going up there. And I believe that the one that's going up, I think it's this week, is on email copywriting and our uh, execution plan for doing that. So if you're interested in that, that'd be good. Um, there were also some questions related to the mobile opt-in that we that we do. Um, we are doing some testing on a plugin that will hopefully make that easier. Uh, but we're going to, you know, one of the execution plans that's going up in the next uh, 30 days or so will be one that is related to a mobile opt-in. So you can, you know, members, you can keep your, your eyes open uh, for that. Um, some people asked about responsive email themes. Where can they, where, where can they find those? I know it's, it's built into a lot of, you know, like MailChimp, I think, has them built in, and some of the other ones have them built in. Yeah, if you're using kind of one of the, the you know, AWebers or, or you know, MailChimp, Exact Target, kind of these guys, um, they have a template library that's pretty vast, and for the most part, you should be able to find something there. Uh, if you're using a more enterprise solution or uh, you're, you're managing your own mail server and you're now having to install kind of a... a program on your server to to act as kind of that WYSIWYG editor uh, to send the emails and segment everything. It can be as, as expensive or as uh, inexpensive as you want it to be. I'll be honest with you, a lot of our, our responsive uh, email themes that, that we've used uh, when we've rolled out new newsletters or I needed to make changes quickly, uh, I bought on ThemeForest. To be just totally yeah, honest so with theme, you, themeforest.net, theme, right? Themeforest.net. I believe one that we're still using today in a in a, a business that has over two hundred thousand subscribers. I paid uh, eight dollars for on <laughs> Themeforest. It gave me twenty two different color variations, and all I had to do was pretty much choose the one that that was closest to my color scheme and put my logo in there. So it doesn't have to be difficult. You can go to themeforest.net. Again, uh, like the others, we don't have any vested interest there. Um, and you can buy, you can search for email templates and, and just make sure that you're searching for responsive themes and, and HTML5. And, and it, it can be that simple. You don't have to go out and hire some custom developer or coder or graphic artist to, to make you some you know $1,000 template, $8 for uh, a, a company that has uh, 200,000 subscribers. So just keep that in mind when you're doing this stuff. Um, most of the other questions, this is going to be the last question that I'm, that I'm really going to have time to get to. Most of the other questions related to, you know, which ESP do you guys use, which email service provider, um, and, and, you know, tons of questions about like, what about AWeber? What about GetResponse? What about this one? What about this one? What about this one? This one? There's a billion of them out there, guys. Um, I will tell you, you know, if you're using, if you're using AWeber or MailChimp or Constant Contact or iContact, 
or get response or any one that actually looks legit it probably is and you're fine if your list is under a hundred thousand people um, and then then you are probably fine when your list size gets over a hundred thousand people and you're mailing more than three or four times a week um, now you're up to about a million mail a month send you know you're, you're kind of scaring it when, when you're when you're sending a million mails a month you are a you know you're a fairly large sender and a lot of these um, solutions while they're very good solutions they're not necessarily designed for you you know like the the folks that own you know Mailchimp they would much rather have a whole bunch of people who have you know five and ten thousand you know they, they'd much rather have a bunch of churches you know they have a few hundred or a couple thousand members than to have a mass mailer that's you know, send it to 100, 150,000 people. And, and they won't say this, and I'm not naming any of them by names, and, but you know, we know for a fact that when our list reached a certain size, we got put on a different server than, than their other ones. And um, so when your list gets to that size, you want to you want to you know consider an enterprise level solution, which is going to be you know a, a pretty expensive investment, or you may need to consider managing your own email server. Um, that's something that we had to do. That's something that we do still do today for some of our lists. So we, uh, for us, people say, which one do you use? We use all of them. We still have Aweber accounts. We still have GetResponse accounts. We still have MailChimp accounts. We still have iContact accounts. I mean, and, and we still use them. And for some businesses, it's great. You know, same with, with when you get into CRMs like Infusion. You know, some of those can, can be okay when your list is a certain size. Um, but when your list gets over, you know, 100,000 or so, you're going to need to look at managing your own mail server. Obviously, that's a pretty complex thing. If you want to do that, you know, if you're at that point, you need to know a lot about this email stuff. You, you should definitely, if you're going to manage your own mail server and you're not coming to, um, the, to email world and you can't send someone to email world, then you, you might want to hold off there. There's, there's good services like email delivered that Rich mentioned before that can help facilitate those. Um, as you get over, you know, when, when you get over, uh, when you're around 100,000 or 150,000 or 200,000 list size, definitely if you're over 250,000 list and you're mailing, you know, four or five times a week, you're sending a half a billion mails a year. Think about that. You're sending a half a billion, you know, if you have some other lists, I mean, you, you can get up there really, really, really quickly when you get into the hundreds of thousands. When you're doing that type of stuff, um, you're going to need an enterprise level provider. Um, I don't want to go into which one we use because I don't want this to be recorded. And for, you know, if somebody listens to this a year from now and we're no longer using it, I don't want to take it as an endorsement. If your list is, you know, 100, 150, 200,000, I'd say if it's at least 100,000 um, and you want to know more about what we are using, the solution that we're using, you can go ahead. Can they email you, Rich? Yeah. I mean, someone, someone doing that obviously needs some, some help and some recommendations and I'd yeah. be, uh, be we'll, glad to field we'll some emails. You, yeah. We'll point you in the right direction. Um, it, Richard at digitalmarketer.com, Richard at digitalmarketer.com. Normally, um, we only offer that, that level of access to our DM lab members. But if you have over a hundred thousand, I'll tell you guys with where things are going right now with email deliverability, you're going to have to do something. Um, we're, we're seeing it with a lot of different people. It's one of the reasons we're doing email world. One of the, one of the reasons we're doing this email world event is to train our own, uh, affiliates and, and strategic partners so that they can do a better job at promoting our stuff. Cause we're watching their opens and their clicks go down because of they're not they haven't really adapted to what is best practices today. So keep that in mind. So, you know, if you want to know more about kind of what we're doing, it is quite expensive. You know, it is, it is a significant investment. We'll point you in the direction of the people that built it for us. Um, and, and that, that are handling it all for us. And, and, uh, so Richard at, uh, digital marketer.com, Richard digital marketer.com, please don't just email them to ask about random other things. You know, we are not going to provide, you know, coaching and, and support like that for free. Um, you know, if, if you're a DM lab member, that that's a little bit different, but we've got some other channels. This really is specific to that email, um, question. So go ahead and email that. With that said, man, I, I think we, uh, we should probably stick a fork in this thing. I mean, we said we'd right. be on for, for 60 minutes. I think we've been on for scaring two and a half hours, but, uh, I hope you guys got a tremendous amount of value. This is a big subject. You know, there's a reason that we're doing an entire four day event around it. And, um, uh, you know, but I thank you, those of you guys who stayed on the entire time. Wow, you know, great. 
Um, it, we're, we're doing these things a, a number of times, so you know, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and sign off now, give our voices a rest, and um, just kind of one last thing, digitalmarketer.com forward slash join dash us. I really do hope you check it out. I sincerely hope you become a member. I have no problem just blatantly asking you to go check it out, sign up, and become a member because I know when you are a member, you're going to get a lot of value out of it, especially if you're going to come to one of our events. With that said, Rich, thanks so much for your preparation and for your work and, and, uh, and insight. Everybody else, uh, thank you for being here, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Take care. Thanks, guys.